Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I don't know how many people are watching currently live, but this is coming from just the event page. Um, I had Dennis share the live feed as well to my Facebook, um, my personal Facebook, not my fan page. Um, uh, in a copy for said post that Dennis just made to my Facebook wall, it has the information for what's going on today. So um, after we do this, I'll clean it up and be a little more simple. But I'm going to go over some things today um, that's going to be from my latest DVD. Well, it's called All My Favorite Things. Um, the link to that is going to be in the description for the copy, like I said. So that will be added to this video afterwards. Um, there's also the two places you can donate. So it's Venmo and PayPal. The Venmo is at christian Woodmancy. Again, if you need a reference, I'm not sure to spell my name, that's confusing. Please go to my personal for personal page and you can see that copy. Or it's PayPal, and the PayPal address is admin at christianwoodmancy.com. Um, for those of you who are dealing with financial hardship right now, I would please ask you to not do any type of donation. In fact, anybody that can't donate today, I just simply ask to share the feed, share the information that we have today, let people see it. So at some point in time, this can grow, right? So for those of you who can donate, I really appreciate it. It's awesome. I'm um, just trying to be able to impact as many people as possible in the way I know how to. So um, hope you have a good time today. Um, I got a plethora of questions. And when I say plethora, for some reason, the Jiu-Jitsu community waits until the last minute as well. And probably from 11.15 to about 11.57, I received about 45 different questions. And as much as I would like to sit here with Dennis and Sasan for hours on end going over all of these, a lot of them were... Um, duplicates are just fantastic and simplified. Um, so I'm going to go over like seven or eight techniques that are just through my thought process. And some of that's a little double dipping because people had questions later while I was going over, but then I'll go to the Q&A section. So Sasan is the man behind the camera today. So if you guys have any questions, live time, as in I show something, and you need to see a detail or you have a thought, type it out. Sasan's paying attention. He's going to literally be able to read it, and I'll say, is anybody asking anything? Sasan will then tell me what's being asked, and I will focus on that point before going to the next technique or concept. So um, this is my first time doing this. It'll be better and better every single time, but I appreciate your patience. Um, I hope you guys are healthy and well, and your families are healthy and well as well with, with what's going on. But um, let's enjoy. We'll have a good time today. We'll try to keep it really clean and simple. Um, so obviously, Dennis Pressy will be my uh, UK today. Um, Things. Again, I'm going to be dipping from my All My Favorite Things DVD. That DVD goes over passes, sweeps, back takes, submissions, drills, takedowns. I'm going to do a little bit of everything just to kind of keep it clean and simple. And again, this is just try to, to get as much information as possible. The Q&A section is actually really, really high quality. I was almost considering only doing Q&A, but maybe that's an idea for next week or two weeks or next month or something like that. So um, let's have a good time. So again, if you have any questions or thoughts, be patient. Comment what your question is. Sasan's watching in real time and he'll be able to let me know when we do it, okay? You said, so, can you be a little louder? Louder? Yeah. Okay. I will be a little louder. Um, big echoes in here. So, um, first technique I'm going to go over is going to be passing spider guard. In this case, it's going to be lasso. I'll talk about some other options as well. It's going to be really simple. So, um, my thought process always, for those of you who know me, who have trained with me, who have come to a seminar or you're my actual student, I prefer to kind of keep things simple because I'm not that intelligent when it comes to in time problem solving. So um, kind of, I'm going to basically understand that Dennis is a few steps ahead and he's in control. He's got tempo. I'm going to use what I got to then basically implode Dennis's guard and pass it before he actually understands what's going on. So we're going to do it from lasso today. So I'm going to ask for a preference for Dennis to lasso this side. But Dennis has a foot in my bicep and he's got a lasso. So for me, it doesn't really matter where this lasso is. There's two options here, okay? When Dennis puts me in this lasso, if my hand that's being lassoed cannot reach the lapel, I know that my hand is able to circle. So that circle is going to be very easy to break. I can start passing the guard. So if it cannot circle because the depth of it, my hand's too far away, that means I can grab the collar. So for those of you who are saying, well, what if I can't do either? That is something that I'm not familiar with. For me, and the understanding the position, how I can move, if I can't grab the collar, I can circle, if I can't circle, I can grab the collar. So I'm in this position, depending on the depth of Dennis's lasso, that's going to determine basically my pass options. So we're going to talk about both real quick. My left hand can't grab anything other than a sleeve or grab the pants. I'm going to grab the pants, keep that grip stationary, try to keep my elbow in to make sure I can kind of 
slow this thing down. First option we're gonna talk about is my hand not being able to reach the collar, which, my, which means my hand is gonna circle, okay? So, the theory of my hand being on the outside is very important. That means that after I break this grip, my thought process is to go to an outside pass because my left hand is on the outside. If I wanted an inside pass or create an inside position, I would circle my hand to the inside and get this grip while he had that lasso. And I'll break that down very simply afterwards. So I prefer passing the outside and getting an outside pass. So what I'm doing is I'm going to circle my hands. I'm going to be using my hips to be moving around, keeping my feet flat. As I go to use my elbow to get close to his thigh, I'm circling my hand to place my hand, my palm on his thigh. If it breaks, great. If it doesn't break, all I'm doing is straightening my wrist and I'm going to stamp the break. The key is that whether he lets go or I break it or it breaks prematurely is that as soon as it breaks, the gunshot goes off and I have to go immediately. So that grip breaks on whatever rule set it is, whether it's me, him, or a combination of both, I've got to go. So I'm instantly using this outside pass, this outside grip, and I go an outside pass. So I'm going to go to a leg drag. So as soon as this grip breaks, I know I'm going to want to grab this same side collar, so that's my preference on a leg drag. So when that grip breaks, I grab the collar, or he's going to shuffle this grip across and go to a leg drag. From that position, then I can work on my leg drag position. I can look for an underhook. If he frames, I can go for some type of flash arm bar. I can push the grip across. But I'm using those grips as efficiently as possible, as quickly as possible to assess the situation. So that one one more time. Dennis has a lasso, but it's not super deep because I can't reach the lapel, okay? Getting an outside pant grip. I'm using my elbow and my hips to be able to stay mobile, getting a good strong posture to circle my hand up and over to grab the thigh. Once that grip breaks, I'm immediately, whether you're gonna grab the lapel first, whatever, this, this pass is taking place. After I throw that grip across because I'm passing the outside, I'm using my right hand for a stabilization grip. So it could be the collar, it could be the belt, it could be the pants, or whatever option you like. I like the collar. So I'm reaching for the collar, I'm jamming across, and I'm looking for this grip. You're going to get lots of different options here. Maybe Dennis keeps the sleeve. That means you're not going to be able to let go of this pant and grab and do something. He's probably going to now use that to retract his leg and start squaring back up. He holds the sleeve. I'm using my grip to stabilize the leg. Now that it's caught, I can use this hand to move because this leg is still stuck. Then I can break the grip and I can move forward. If I go to do this and Dennis lets go of the sleeve and he starts facing or doing whatever his understanding of guard retention is, I'm controlling. From there I can see the back, I can chase and go. A lot of this is going to be very, very quick in the moment, but you need to slow it down in drilling and training to see your options there, right? So that was outside. So inside theory. <clears throat> That lasso is there. I want, the, I want an, an inside leg variation now. So I'm gonna circle my hand and I'm gonna look for this inside grip. This, this foot that is on the nook of my elbow, but it's very weak, it's gonna come off later. So as I circle my hand, I'm gonna break that grip. I can now use that position to push down and step. Now I'm gonna be on the inside. You can look for an over-under pass, you can take the leg inside, you can hug, you can get a lapel grip, you can switch, you can heat on the opposite side. There's lots of options now that I'm on the inside, but I'm using that inside grip to stay on the inside to move forward, okay? Do that one one more time. Shadow lasso, I can't reach the lapel. I don't want the outside now. I'm looking to be able, and if I have to use my knee to circle my hand on the inside, I will. But I'm making sure that grip is on the inside. So now when I go to move and I go to rotate, I go to break this grip off. I can use that now to push and step. And then from there, you can put your knee down, the cross face, and back step. You can go here, you can go over under. I can grab the pole, grab an underhook, and I can switch sides, go with my knee cut and step. So that theory is very, very simple. Okay. So to recap, I know it's a lot of information. Shallow lasso means I'm circling my hand. If I can't grab the lapel, I'm circling my hand and using that as my foundation to move forward. But before I move forward, I have to pick with my opposite hand if I'm going to be doing it outside or inside grip to determine my pass sequence. Whatever options you like from there is up to you. I'm trying to keep things simple, so I always try to, try to funnel into a specific position that I have. So, I'm gonna take like 15 seconds, see if anybody has any thoughts or questions about that specific example that we just talked about, and then I'll move on to a deep lasso. So I'm gonna sit here awkwardly, talk to Dennis for a couple seconds, wait to see if you say anything, if the sign says something to me, and then we'll go forward. I wonder if this structure is simple enough or not. Yeah? I think it's tough because a lot of people, when they're watching this, they're, they're like, not really like that. So things are getting better there in the process there. And obviously there's a hundred people that are watching this, you know? Yeah. 
Anybody saying anything? Cool, good. So now let's go to the real magic, which is what I prefer. So for me, same thing, yeah. So for me, usually people, especially my own students or people that I try to impact, I tell them about the integrity and the value of whether they have a shallow lasso or a deep lasso, this changes things, it changes the options on top, the options on bottom. You have to have the understanding of both, right? So this is gonna be now where I can't circle my hand, which means I can grab the lapel, I'm gonna use those grips. I like to get to a knee cut position, but again, I'll show you plenty of options so you can be a unique and individual on your own. So everything is the same. So he goes lasso, but now this is deep. I can't circle my hand, but that lapel is there. I try to grab this lapel when I know what's already happening. So to be very, very blunt with you, I'm not going to allow Dennis just to put me in a deep lasso spider to then pass the spider guard. In fact, this is probably being created from somewhere else, a different guard of some sort. He got me, you can't just pull lasso spider from standing. So you really wanna try and see this coming from a couple of steps away. So when I get this lapel, I'm using this lapel as my stabilization grip for moving forward. I'm actually gonna end up knee cutting here and I can take it back depending on where I wanna go or funnel from here. So again, what I'm gonna do is first grab the pants. Now I'm not gonna need these pants later, but I can use the option if I want. But what I wanna do is use this grip to slow down and bring my elbow in, just to try and stationary, like immobilize this leg. So you can come here, but what I prefer to do is shuffle literally. I don't wanna circle. I try to stay on his hip line and move to the side. I'm gonna use my inside knee, which is the same knee of the, the side of the lasso, to push down on his knee. I'll then use my posture to open up my chest, letting go of the pant now to rotate my hand on the inside to use that same type of circling position to break the grip. And all I wanna do is push down on the leg. Now I'm gonna be inside, so now I'm gonna be doing an inside pass. If Dennis lets go or if the grip breaks, great. If you grab the sleeve afterwards, it's fine. It just changes options. Again, you wanna be clear on what you can actually do in this position. So now that I'm here, all my weight's gonna be on this hand. I'm gonna take my shin off of this leg, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go square back up, and now I'm gonna immediately go backwards. And what I wanna do when I go backwards is I almost wanna lift both of Dennis's shoulders off the mat, and I'm gonna shrug and pull my elbow into my hip. It's gonna lower his lasso leg so I can clear it. So after I pop up and I come back, I move back, and I pull his leg forward by bringing my elbow to my hip. I'll change the angles on this too so you can see. Once that foot comes over, I immediately relocate my elbow. I'm gonna be trying to put my forearm onto his thigh and push his knee in towards his head so I can immobilize and literally relasso me. So once it comes off, I'm driving and going forward and rolling my elbow up. And now all I'm doing is driving that and then coming back over the top. So now I'm in a position where I'm using the lapel against him and I'm controlling that leg. Now is where you wanna slow things down and see your options or pick where you wanna go. I'm trying to keep my left hand away. If Dennis has that sleeve, I have to break that grip first if I want to some type of specific pass sequence. I'm going to now use this position to slide down. As soon as my hip hits the mat, I'm off the mat and I'm clearing that bottom leg to push across. From there, if I can get up under and see the back, I'll take it. If I'm here and then Dan starts to pull and hip escape and he tries to face me, I can now use this lapel and pull punch and then chase the back again, right? So I'm constantly staying in this funnel like position. What I'm doing is basically understanding. Dennis is ahead of tempo. Take the position that he's given me since I don't have any say and use it against him so I don't have to spend a lot of time breaking a lot of grips and changing the position. It's gonna get real messy sometimes. And I'm basically making sure that when any point in time he's stopping the stabilization grip, that I'm moving forward correctly, okay? So let's do that one one more time. Huh? Same angle that I switch again. So he's got this last one out. My arm is deeper, I can't circle. There's no way this grip is circling. But I can see the lapel. I'm grabbing it and keep my elbow close. Grabbing the pants only for stabilization. I'm going to move linearly and push down on his knee right where it bends. I'm going to use my posh now to circle my hand and rotate to put my hand down. If the grip breaks, great. If it doesn't, if it grips, it's okay. It's all going to just change how we move forward. From here, all I'm going to do now is come back up to my feet, square up with him, and move back and shuck. As soon as I shuck, I drive back forward, opening my elbow and pushing. From there, I'm just gonna come right back because my preference is knee cut. You don't have to come back to knee cut. You can staple on the inside here. And from here, now in this position, I can circle my hand back off and grab his head at the step. If you want to, you can grab the lapel, you grab the unhook, you can switch the opposite side. Again, lots of options. As long as you know them, they're consistent. You're always funneling, you can get there, okay? Let me change the angle a little bit so you can see. Yep. 
My hand is here, grabbing the lapel, grabbing the pants. Push down, open and circle. From there I'm up and back I shut, I go forward. My preference is to go knee cuts. I put my knee down, I don't care where his elbow is. I prefer to drive forward, take side control. I can go on the inside, I want to go on the outside and try to influence a hip escape I can, it's really up to you. I'm gonna slide down, circle back, push into him, looking for that underhook. If he's framing, he's trying to stay away, I can try to shuffle across. If he tries to hip escape and face me, that's my time to push, step, and then chase the back from there. So, again, to simplify this and talk about the theory, Dennis has a version of spider guard. I need to first make the choice depending on what grips are available to me. If I want to, after breaking those grips or whatever it may be, pass from the inside or the outside. Once you're there, it's a little more clear, it's a little more simple. This is something you want to think about. For me, this is the only way that I pass spider guard. Anything I pass with a lasso, if I can reach the lat, if I can reach the lapel, I use it. If I can't, I keep it away. So again, another like 20, 30 seconds to see if anybody has any questions or thoughts and we'll move ahead to the second one shortly. Could you demonstrate this at the angle where the lasso is? Yes. That leg is deep. It's actually really, really hard for me to stand up, but it makes it even easier to grab the lapel. Now, do a good job, keep that leg there. Dennis is not gonna be coaxing me along and trying to make this technique look like it's simple. So that's, this leg is stuck. In fact, if it's really hard for me to stand up, my arm is actually really, really hard to straighten, but I can bend it, right? So it's there. Grabbing the pants, shuffle, push down, circle. As soon as I come up, I back up. I then use it, as soon as I back up and that foot pops out, I'm using my elbow to turn towards his knee. When that elbow turns towards his knee, I'm using my jaw to come back forward. And if he's really flexible and you feel like you can't get underneath, you can come inside and come here and start using the position to break and go leg drive. If, and I usually never have this problem, if you're here and you can't get in a position, I just keep driving and I circle my hand underneath. And this is where you can find any position that you like to, any position that you like to. You can come inside and then you can go. So the key here is to be using the ability, the collar, to keep your shoulders off the mat. It's going to be like a seesaw. So theoretically speaking, the higher his head comes, the lower his foot will go. I need to get that foot out of my armpit, out of my lap, out of my, my rib position. If his shoulders and his head are down, his leg is going to have the ability to stay really, really high. So I'm pulling him and seesawing him. I'm basically tilting him on his butt to bring his head up higher so his leg can come lower. And when that switch is happening, I'm exaggerating it by pulling and snapping. All I need is that little bit of instant is foot dropping. But as soon as that foot drops, I change the position of my elbow so that it can't be placed back again. It's like the same theory of if I break off the deli heel hook and then I change the angle of my knee, even though he's still in the same position, he cannot place his deli heel hook back unless he repositions himself. So the key here is to use the lapel to shuck the foot off and immediately address the knee line so that he can't place the lasso back in and then using that to move forward, leg drag, knee cut, back stepping, whatever it may be. So really, really think about that because a lot of people that I talk this to or I explain this to will stand in the same spot and they just use their arm to just sit here like this. And just pulling your arm is not gonna do anything because theoretically speaking, I probably can't do this and pick up Dennis's entire body. So when I square back up to him, I move back. And in fact, the closer I keep my elbow, the stronger my core is, I can lift Dennis. So the key is literally, if I could do this, it'd be like a directional pad, I move literally only to address the leg that's, a, that's on my bicep. I come back to the center point and then I move straight back and down, making like this upside down 90 degree angle. And when I hit that pivotal point where he seesaws, I snap my elbow back, that's when the foot pops off. And then I drive right back forward again and I go right back to the left. So I'm basically only doing this upside down L position. If that makes sense, I hope that helps. Does that angle help? Yeah. Did anybody else ask anything? No? Good. Give like 12 seconds and anybody says anything, we'll go to number two. What's number two, Susan? Uh Side control triangle. Perfect. Anything? Good. 
great, grand, wonderful. Okay, jumping all along, right? So that was a pass. Perhaps we get to side control from here, whatever it may be. Talk about my theory of side control. Side control is a tough place to be, especially for a small man. What? Is there, is there any difference if the lasso is shallow uh, in the initial side shuffle? No, if the lasso is shallow, more than likely there's gonna be a lot of freedom for me to probably move my, my arm and my hand. So you wanna think about like what your go-to is. For me, if I, always, if I have the option and need me to circle my hand, I take it. If that, sha if, that, if that lasso is shallow, it's usually easy for me to move my hand. Whether my hand is very close and the lasso is shallow or not, I'm always trying to retract and circle. So if the, sh if, the, if the lasso is shallow, my number one instinct is like, well, just get rid of the lasso, just circle my hand out. That pass is very quick, it's very easy to do, and it'll connect a lot smoother. If that, that lasso is shallow, usually the integrity of that lasso is not strong, it's not impacting my posture, which means I, it's, it's a lot different than you need to reach the lapel or not. If it's a shallow lasso, I don't need to grab the lapel because my hand's not stuck there. The only time I'm stuck grabbing the lapel is if my hand cannot move. So I'm gonna be really clear there. Does that make sense? Why well, shouldn't be asking that about because nobody's gonna say yes, right? Did anybody else ask anything about that? No, Kanan just said smash through it. Yeah, yes, yeah, Kanan just smash through it. <laughs> okay, so let's go to side control setup. So this is something, again, I'm not, doesn't matter. I'm not a huge fan of being the small guy against the big guy inside control. In fact, the theory of my concept is there. It's on a different DVD that we're not talking about today, but it's beating the bigger guy that's coming out soon, is that I don't really want to be in side control unless I have certain elements controlled. I've talked about this millions and millions of times. So if Dennis has the ability to hip escape, which means he's dictating and controlling his inside elbow, I'm never ever trusting Dennis to do that or not do it. I need to be in a position to where I can still have success and progress. So, I can get here many different ways. It can be by him making a mistake, it can be by me creating it from a pass sequence, whatever it may be. But I only do this triangle setup if I can put my knees down in side control, which means I need this inside elbow controller. We're gonna change angles here multiple times, so just be patient with this because it's very awkward. Um, so again, I will do it in a pass sequence. Um, this is not part of this, but let's say, Let's say I do a pass sequence like uh, hand on the hip, knee, I go to clear, I go to this position, and I step in here like this, right? This is the position I set this triangle up from. Actually, spin around this time. So I got here, and I did this thing, right? So I know that I don't have the ability to wait here very long. In fact, you can see Dennis has freedom in both of his elbows. He can go forward or backwards. Both of his legs are free. I will control this inside, like this is not the conversation, but. What I'll do from here is I'll keep the hip line and I'll hit up so I clear that elbow. So now I know when I stabilize the side control that I can put my knee down because his elbow is above his shoulder, which will allow me then to control. Now he can't hit the skate, right? Check this way. So now he can't hit the skate. This is completely different than if I'm here and his elbow is on the inside, or if his elbow is, is, is being trusted to being on the inside because I don't know if he can hit the escape, if he will do so efficiently, right? So I do this triangle setup. I usually do it, I, I create it from a pass sequence, so in this way, when I get there, it's really, really strong and ready to go. So again, I usually don't get in this type of side control. I put my knees down and then I try to do this thing. For me, that never, ever, ever works unless I'm going with someone who's really bad at jiu-jitsu or they've got really weird goals that day and it's kind of easier to do, so I don't rely on that. I'm creating this from a different sequence, okay? So I'm getting the side control with that inside elbow up, but it's gotta be above the shoulder, okay? Let's just, yeah, keep it this way. So I'm inside here. My arm, that's the same side of his head, is literally gonna be grabbing either the knee or grabbing the shoulder, but maybe even it's underneath of his head. And what I'm doing is I'm keeping my knee, my elbow on the inside of my thighs. That's gonna give me a little room to keep his elbow stuck. And I'm trying to drive my elbow down while keeping my knee underneath of his head. This is going to allow me to put my weight on my, on my ribs and keep his arms stuck. Because even though he has his feet, he's going to wiggle around and try to adjust his shoulder to get his elbow back in the correct position. Okay? I would prefer if I lose that elbow to go hip check and start chasing it more on this, but it's a different story. So when I'm holding the gear, I'm holding the shoulder here, I'm using my free hand now to push and drive. So I'm going to use my right hand, my right foot, to drive him up. 
And all I'm going to do is replace that space by bringing my knee to his spine in the back of his neck. And then I'm pummeling my foot along his spine behind his back. What I'm doing is I'm creating a keel on the bottom of a boat. So if Dennis wants to, he's unable to go flat. He's on dry land. He's got to either sit on his left or sit on his right. So what I'm doing is I'm putting him on his left so his only option is to be on his right. So now what I'm doing is I'm taking my knee in and he can go on his hip or whatever it may be. And I'm starting to look for this arm. This arm could be in a lot of places. It could just be out there doing nothing. It could be framed. It could be reaching for something. I don't know. But all I need to make sure is that wherever it is, there's a clear path to bring my right leg up and over. And I usually do this by just stepping over, but now I do it by falling back. So my preference is to hold it. If it's far away, I can keep it away, but it's going to be a lot of flexibility. And what I'll do if that hand is away is I'll start to like attack his neck and bring his arm in. And then I'll follow my hand and I'll start to hold it. All I need to do is hold this hand on his chest. Now the key here is I don't want to fall back. The key here is that I want to fall off on an angle. I actually want to try and, and when, when this is being done to you, you'll feel like a separation of your, your shoulder because it's pulling your arm out of your shoulder, which is why your body's going to follow. And I just go back, it doesn't create that kind of pressure. So all I'm going to be doing is falling back on this side. You can see that Dennis wants to follow me. So if I keep that attached and I keep pulling him, he's good. he can't stay flat, he'll have to follow. And all I'm doing is I'm keeping this left hand underneath his head in the same exact position. All I'm going to do is bring my right shin to my left hand here. And then from there, since my foot was already along, as he comes up, it's easy for me to instantly make my adjustments. In fact, I won't even get his arm across. I'll just finish the triangle from here, or I'll push under hook and lock and then go for the triangle whatever it may be. This triangle is very quick, very smooth. And it uses his element against him, right? Let's um, let's change the angle this way. Nice. So as you can see, side control. Put your legs up so you can see a little bit, right? Side control, but my knee, my leg is above his shoulder line, which means his elbow will be above his shoulder line. Underneath the head, holding his shoulder, grabbing the material if you like. If it's Gian, no knee doesn't matter. No Gian is going to reach in and grab his armpit, or I'm going to hold his shoulder and pull him in. So it doesn't really matter if it's Gian or no knee, but if I've got the Gian, I'm going to use it. Pulling my elbow in, making sure that everything in there is nice and tight and his elbow stays stuck, okay? Right hand, right foot, using the drive him forward on the side to bring my knee to the back of his head and bring my foot along his back, creating that position here. Now that he's stuck and I'm sitting here, you can bring this knee up if you like and come behind his back and keep that space nice and tight. Looking to track that arm. I'm not gonna be falling back. I'm gonna be falling off onto an angle. And when I do that, I keep my elbow in the same position. I'm not stretching myself out. I use my core to bring it towards me and just connecting my hand to my leg. Then from there, you can just cut, chop, and go. Let's do you over here you come behind me. So again, we're here, on the ladder, I'm pushing, I'm driving, stepping inside, connecting that foot. I'm here nice and tight. My knee comes up. I'm not going back. I'm going off on an angle. Stepping, a hook, come inside, you can connect. So, to be blunt with you, I'm not really a big fan of triangles because I don't like doing some type of submission. Literally on bottom, the opportunity of being stacked, the opportunity of having to fight against size, right? So, if it's someone my size, I've done this in tournaments, I've done this in IBJJF, I've got no problem doing it. If it's someone like Kanan or if it's someone bigger, I'm probably a little more weary from going on top in a nice dominant position to wanting to go on bottom with a triangle. In fact, if I was coaching myself, I'd probably yell at myself for doing this in a tournament. So I would only be doing this with someone my size when I'm feeling dominant and I'm up on points and I know the outcome of what's going to take place. Or you need to throw a hail in there, whatever it may be, but it's very, very specific, especially competition oriented. It's in the gym, it's completely different. But we really want to think about that. So if I were to be in this position, side control the bigger guy, elbow controlled or not, I wouldn't even be looking for this submission. In fact, if I had his elbow controlled, I would literally leave that position just to go hip check side control. If he wants to hip escape, I'll come over him. If he doesn't want to hip escape, I'll come over him. I'm going to do whatever I want to from there. So be very, very particular if you're watching this and you're someone of either gender and you're, there's a 40, 50, 60 pound weight difference between you and your partner. I would definitely tell you to consider not doing this technique because of the potential of what could take place in terms of now being in the bottom position in a triangle, possibly being stacked, and I'm going to guard pass, and now you're going to be a bottom side control. So really be thinking about that. So 
Give like 15. Okay, it's already a question, yeah. Can you do a little butt scoot if you have long, dumb legs to make space? Where? Make space where? To throw the leg over. Um, that's what I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, let's see if he says anything. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what's happening is, is the space that I have on top of Dennis, go down real quick. The space that I have on top of Dennis, in terms of being chest to chest, I never want that to change. So if you feel like you need to scoot back to like bring your leg over, you're probably gonna open up a lot, which is, which is not wrong, but it's gonna change the level of value of your triangle once you lock your triangle because of the angle that you're gonna have. If you can keep this super tight and I like never move my chest position, this is tight. If I start to scoot and move to create space, I now have less integrity in pulling Dennis to me. So, can you scoot? Yeah, 100%. Do you need to? It, then yes, do it. It will, though, affect the level of quality your triangle is going to have, which means I would suggest as soon as getting there, being really quick with making your adjustments. Same guy, Brad Bentley, said, uh, could you scoot more north, like towards the head? Oh, yes. The, the, the higher the elbow goes, the easier it is. So 100%. I kind of played a little bit almost too dangerous and this elbow was like almost right on that line of his shoulder. My, my, like this is my minimum. If you, can, if you can jack this thing up and be up here 100%, this is only going to um, amplify how strong that pull is that Dennis is gonna to come towards you. So 100% you definitely can. In fact, if you can, if you can put his elbow, and I don't wanna hurt Dennis, all the way to his head, it's gonna be an even tighter triangle, it'll be even stronger of a pull. So 100% yes. I would say it's okay to scoot uh, in terms of like, with Dennis's body angle, I don't wanna go away from Dennis. So I, that clarity is really important. But yes, 100% go towards his head, for sure. Uh, Chris Matico asks, speaking that you mentioned you don't like the triangle, would a more secure option being a back take from the position where you put the shin close to the back? Uh, it will be hard because Dennis has the underhook. So let me, yeah, so let's say, let's say we got here, like I wanted to take Dennis's back, it's gonna be really hard because Dennis has the underhook. Maybe he's trying to get his arm out, maybe not, but you would see that I would have to at some point in time, this would have to take place, which is gonna be kind of hard. I would then like start to address trying to take the back, like some type of, different way to do it a different way, but like it would be, I would tell you that anytime there's someone has an underhook on you, theoretically speaking, you're more susceptible to having your back take in. So in this position, I wouldn't go for the back. If I were to go for the back while having his arm here, I would literally check the hip, go back from over the top, and I start to be looking for my hip check series using the, the Kimura to take the back then. But I would not use this set up to go to the back 100%. No, I would bail beforehand. So my thought process after getting the side control would be to take the back, i.e. I passed a really big guy's guard, now I want to take his back. I would go hip check from there, start running north south of the Kimura, use the Kimura to take his back, and let him hip escape and top spin. But I wouldn't do it from this position or setup. Two questions from Joan Zalowski. Are you using your leg like to kickstand uh, in order to roll him to his side? Uh, and then second, what are you doing and how are you positioning the body to negate his body weight in rolling him? Okay, perfect. So, let Dennis fix his hair. He's got a lot of little, he's got a little quick. Uh, <laughs> I'll go this side, this way. So when I get here, let me push you up. When I get here, this leg comes up with a kickstand leg. This leg is only to really like keep him on his side. I like him being here. I don't like keeping his leg back because he may turn his hips, which is gonna try to loosen up his shoulders. So once I get him on his side, I try to keep him there. Now, this leg is doing nothing other than just kickstanding here and trying to keep that support on that wall. So I'm not trying to like drive him forward. I'm not trying to use it to pull him back. Literally, all I'm doing to do this is literally pushing off on the side. My, my foot is not actually pushing. All I'm doing is free falling to that side. Dennis will always follow. And in fact, I will tell you to answer both questions. 
I'm actually not changing my distance and pulling him. What I'm doing is I'm keeping my arm underneath his head at a 90 degree or less angle. And when I grab and I secure that, I would tell you to try and keep your shoulder on your hand. And all I'm doing is going from this position to this position to falling on my back. So in fact, if we were to like take away gravity, my body position and how it is addressed to Dennis in terms of the distance and space should never change. And that is allowing me to, I can literally do this to somebody of any size because once the leg is underneath the spine, the back is unable to be flat. And what will happen is Dennis can either be on his left shoulder or on his right shoulder. So that pivot point of driving him on his side, putting a leg in between him, that he can't stop here. So this is an easy transition. And in that transition is when I throw my leg over. Um, put your head that way. So if you can see right now, I put my knee up and my foot is behind his back. If I, if I went off on an angle, Dennis is literally gonna have the ability to feel the separation in his shoulder. What I'm doing by attaching myself is that as I fall, Dennis has to follow. There's no pull. I could over-exaggerate that, but all I'm really doing is my free body weight is falling down. And all I'm doing now is keeping that space and then placing myself on the ground. So the key here is that I'm using, I'm using Dennis's body mechanics against him because there's no way that Dennis can lay flat with my entire leg underneath of his back. So like this theory is like something you could learn from like JT or someone who passes where they place their hand when they pass in between your shoulder blades and the pressure and force that it creates is that you literally, your body can't move in a certain way. So what I'm doing is by mimicking the, the line of his spine with my leg, I'm taking his inability away to be flat. And where does he want to be to hip escape? Probably flat. Where is the triangle exist? On the side. So I'm using that transition from this side to this side to just get my leg over. If he doesn't want to follow me or you detach yourself and make a mistake and I get my leg over, there's still a triangle there, it's just messy. The key there is like, let me do this drill real quick. The key there is that when I move forward and I'm here, I literally don't move the space, I just put my hand to my leg. I'm literally in the same position the entire time. The only difference is that I'm falling over, so it looks like there's some kind of magical pull, but there's really not. In fact, I wish I could have like 18 people of all different sizes line up, and every single person, regardless of body size, even though I wouldn't do this to a guy that's 300 pounds, will always follow, because it's a pure technique, there's no strength. Is there anything else or no? No. Cool. Uh, what's number? Three. Three. Single to double. Nice. Let's do some wrestling. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> you didn't warn me about that. <laughs> I would not have came. I would not came. Right. So, um, I, I enjoy wrestling, but I'm not a huge wrestler because people in my size don't wrestle. Um, but uh, many people do. So, um, common thing that you see, regardless of size or whatever it may be, is when people attempt to wrestle, there's usually the same type of um, walls that they hit, the issues that they they, they meet. So. This is a common thing that you're gonna see. If you can get both legs, it's called a double leg. You get one leg, it's called a single leg. It's not rocket science, right? But this is a common thing that's gonna happen. There's, there's endless ways of getting there. So and the reason why I like this, I show this, and I talk about this, is because often in gi or in no gi, for smaller people on bottom, their failed sweeps turn into single legs. They chase something up, they have a single leg. They sit up, they have a single leg. They go to do something, the guy runs away, and has a single leg. In fact, a lot of competitive jiu-jitsu because of the person on top's desire to not get swept will turn into some type of wrestling scramble. So I always suggest to people regardless, even if they don't wrestle and they pull guard or it's gi or it's no gi, that you should definitely have some type of foundation with wrestling because it's going to show its face. In fact, if you're doing this from the opposite theory, if Dennis is really good at understanding that he can not get swept and he can bait me into single leg him to sit up, and he's better, better at defending that position, it's almost his ability to never get swept because he's funneling me in when he's unable to pass to basically reset position with this. I've seen it all the time. So you've got to be really, really clear with this. You watch guys that are like good wrestlers, they're able to, to connect jiu-jitsu wrestling because they're funneling towards a single leg, right? So, we do this in a thousand different places. I'm not really worried about it. I'm gonna show a couple different examples, but it's gonna be really smooth and clean for no matter what you do. So you can do it from standing, you can do it from a guard, you can do it from a scramble, it's up to you. 
Um, I think we have a decent amount of yeah. top yeah. 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 So tons of things can happen, right? Collar tie, come inside for, for this Russian. He can post on me. I can clear, I can have single leg. Not magic, right? I can come inside for this arm drag, go for a single leg. It's not magic. I can leave to set up the single leg. It's not magic. I could be in Deli Kiva and I can push, sit, and get into the single leg. So the technique is not before any point into the point where I have his leg and my head is on the inside of his ribs. Very, very simple. Okay. The key here is that Dennis's foot, Dennis's knee, Dennis's hip, and Dennis's shoulder should not be in a line vertically. They should be angled. Okay. The problem is, is that if I don't move my feet, or if my head is in the wrong position, some of those or all of those will start to line up. And the more that he can line them up and either keep them here or then put them in the opposite direction, that's where the defense or he takes advantage of it and it actually turns into something that's good for him. So a picture perfect single leg in my eyes would be look at his foot, look at his knee, look at his, look at his hip, and then look at his shoulder. So they're all out of line. His defense is by getting his foot down, getting his knee in line, getting his head there, and then that's his defense. If for some reason I were, he were to continue putting his shoulder forward and his leg back, I'll probably be in a sprawl position. He'll probably be attacking the front headlock or something like this. So in this position, this is good for me. This is the tempo being moved and it's good for him. And this is where it's really bad for me and I was taking advantage of the situation and I've made crucial mistakes that I should have understood and I'm probably not understanding what's going on, right? So I try to keep him here. And by doing that, I'm focusing on head position, and moving my feet. If I'm stationary, it's easy for him to start doing this. If my head is off, it's easy for him to start doing this. So wherever you go, I'm just trying to keep his foot away from his hip. I'm trying to literally pull his foot away from his hip. And the only thing I've got up here, depending on your setup, it could be a collar and I could be pushing, or it could be my head, okay? But the key here is that everything on my body has a job. My legs are pull, keeping his foot away from his knee. My one arm is keeping his knee away from his hip. My head is keeping away his shoulder from his hip. Each, each connection point has a job, and if one's not doing it, the next one in line will fail. It's literally a ladder like we talk about with any type of system, right? So the key here when I get here, again, my knees are keeping them away. I'm controlling here, I'm controlling here. Maybe you're here, maybe you're here. It's really up to you, it depends on your setup again. The key is I want to move my legs. Now, if I can finish a single leg, it's very simple, it's great. But most people, what they're doing, either voluntarily or Dennis is doing it, is my head is going to the outside, okay? Dennis can be either trying to defend and sprawl, try to guillotine me, try to push, whatever it may be. I'm not a huge fan of being here because if I'm here, I'm going to like a body lock position, attacking the back. I'm not a huge wrestler. I'm not teaching that type of wrestling because I suck at it, right? I try to always connect this in front of this and go and do a single leg to a double leg position because I know if I can't finish a single leg, my head goes to the outside, I run and blast my double leg. We'll do this slow because Dennis didn't know what was going on today and I don't want to be rude. So I'm in this position, whether I've got the collar or not, and I'm pulling and moving my feet constantly. Whether I put my head here or Dennis pushes my head here, whenever my ear touches his ribs, that's my shot to go. My right ear in this sense would be the one that I'm talking about. So as my right ear touches his ribs, my right hand is looking for this knee, and all I'm going to do is run and flare. Okay? The key here is that they can't be kind of out of alignment. I can't put my head here and move around and try to go. If you could, it's going to lower the quality, right? So as I'm trying to look, look for this, if I, if I, my, my go-to is what I do is I go, this is how I teach the kids class. I literally just, as slow as you want without stopping, I just keep moving back. And what I do as he keeps following with that leg is as he's coming back and I put my head on the outside, as soon as my ear hits, I change direction, and all I'm doing is touching and reaching for that knee tap as I sprint to run the, the double leg down, right? So the key here, the more you exaggerate your foot movement, the more that this thing starts happening and it starts being a hop, okay? So I'm literally gonna start, how far in frame are we over here? That's as far as you can Okay, go. cool. So literally, what I'll do is I'll go all the way down until I hit the frame the other side, and then as soon as I feel that foot hit, it's a sprint, so it's back, and then forward. It's not back, stop, then forward. So I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving. I'm using that time of him trailing to get his foot to come forward so I can reach for his knee and then I can just run through. 
D or no D, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the setup, whatever it may be. You can use the collar, but your hands are going from the collar to the knee. You can be on the leg from here, it's fine. He can push my head or I can push my head, but whenever my ear hits, my hand reaches to that opposite knee. So again, we can do a thousand different ways of getting there, right? I come inside, she tries to post on me, I can use that to push, I can choose, I move back, snap, and I go. Super simple. We could be doing jujitsu. I could be in this position where I got push, get up, and I run and I hit him. The key here is the transition and the timing of the change in single leg moving back and sprinting and running double leg. For me, this like this is a whip, it's a really easy flare. So like, in fact, if you said do a double leg and flare, my problem would suck. But if I did it from this setup, it, it looks beautiful, it looks cinematic, and it makes a lot more sense. The key here when I tell all of my students or when I teach any seminars is that if you lack the ability to wrestle, the key is to understand the quality of your hands and your head position and don't stop moving your feet. The worst thing you can do when you don't know how to wrestle, or maybe if you, even if you do, I don't know, that's not my place to speak. But for me, because I don't know how to wrestle, is to stop moving my feet. I get a guy that's 190, I grab a single leg, and then all of a sudden I stay still. I guarantee nine times out of 10, regardless of the guy's experience level, that I'm probably not gonna get a takedown anymore. So the key for me is to move my feet, move my feet, and now I'm using that movement efficiently to run through. Does anybody have any questions right away? Nope. Wait like 10 or 15 seconds, see if you guys have any thoughts, and we'll go to the next one. Do you remember when I talked where it's like a high crotch real quick? That one's pretty good too. You catch it in mid hop. Oh, you're there. You're dead. It's an easy tap. <laughs> Anything? Uh, unrelated, but uh, Craig says, rumor has it, the only technique you haven't put on film DVD is your Kimura to triangle setups. If, <laughs> We're doing good work. If said rumor is true, can you show one or two examples? Thanks, best friend. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate you using this time efficiently to say it now rather than follow directions for the past 72 hours of message me. But other people <laughs> talked about Kimura stuff. As much as I would love to have a Kimura DVD, it's literally been played out so much that I don't really have anything that's too unique, so I don't want to waste the time. What else right. do we got? Tommy asks, how about going for a blast double and not getting stuck in the closed guard? Andre's really good at wrestling, especially glass doubles, his head positioning and how he runs through. It's all about timing, but for, you can probably, like, um, I think maybe Carlos Soto is watching, which is a really good friend of mine from this academy. Um, he's a, an amazing wrestler as well. But, like, for me, there's no point in being in anybody's close guard ever. So, like, uh, the key that I would drill, especially when doing just glass doubles, is that I'm not looking to spear the guy and just run him over. I'm making sure that I, I don't land in his guard, you know, but, like, if I'm gonna put my head in the center and put both hands behind his knees, I just need to make sure that I redirect my legs away from his legs so I'm not landing in his closed guard. I would love to blast double Dennis eight or nine times and show you how to not do that, but since you are my student, we'll definitely chat about it uh, later on. But watch some videos, watch uh, watch Andre versus Felipe Pena, just the recent ABCCs and see his his blast doubles. Um, there's also Matthew King versus Hanlo for ACB where he blast doubled him off the stage, but Look at Andre's stuff, watch his blast doubles in his head position, and you'll see his wrestling and how he's not landing in the closed guard. So it's important to, to, to never have such a good attack that you put yourself in a bad position that you can't get out of. So I would definitely focus Tommy on not being able to, you do never want to be in someone's closed guard. We'll talk about it from here for a moment, but um, <laughs> let's make sure that if you're going to use your wrestling, which you do very well, to stay outside of the legs. And if your hands are on the knees or the legs, just direct them away from yours, then you should be good. At a minimum, if anything, you should land half guard or something like that. That, that should be it. Is there anything else that's being asked? Um, what are your best arm bars? But, yeah. All right, what's the next one? 50-50 uh, back tape. Cool. So I'm going to be in 50-50. Dennis will stand up. Nothing crazy. There's a lot of back takes that I know and have. Some of them I actually didn't put on that 50-50 DVD, and we'll go over that later. But... Um, this is just going to be when Dennis stands up. This is like one of my go-tos. I connect from a lot of positions, but um, I either he's standing up and I get 50-50 and I do it. I'm in 50-50 and he stands up. However we got there, we're just going from there. So you want to start in there. Okay, so let's turn this one. 
Yeah. So I just, we both have 50 50. I would tell you that it's important to kind of understand 50 50, you know what grips you like. So when I see Dennis open up his 50 50 and that leg has gotten away from me, I theoretically know what his options and his capabilities are. And for him to stand up, I know how he has to basically shift his weight, that leg's going to have to go behind him, etc., etc. So if for some reason Dennis is standing up and you don't know it, it happened until after you stand up, there was a big mistake that took place. So for me, whether I have it right away or I see this process taking place, if my right hand is my inside hand, for me it's important that I'm grabbing the pants and my elbows on the inside. I don't like being here, I prefer to be here. And the reason for that is because I want to create space. Now, if Dennis is in 50-50 already, I promise you that this hand, his right hand, because his right leg is inside, will be susceptible to me grabbing it with my other hand. So it can even be over here, and he's using that to do a technical stand-up. He can be holding my leg, he can be holding my pants, but wherever it is, he can be holding my collar. And if that's the case, I'm using a two-on-one and then getting it. But wherever it may be, I need to hold that sleeve. I need to be able to have that grip without him neutralizing it. So when he stands up, I can use it against him. So again, depending on the situation, it's already here, I'm gonna grab this here, I'm grabbing this here, and I'm getting inside of this position. If he's holding these pants like this, I'm grabbing it, kicking, whatever it may be, I can't start my back take sequence until I have this pant grip, my elbow on the inside, and I got this sleeve grip with his hand not grabbing anything, okay? So that, that, that grip can't stay here, this grip can't stay here. I don't do it like that, so at some point in time before I start my sequence, this grip has to come up. So just stand up. Watch how Dennis stood up, right? Basic technical stand up, stand all the way up if you like. We're gonna be inside this position. So again, that hand is on the same side hand, my elbow's on the inside. I'll actually use that frame to help me stay up. Because if you don't use that frame to stand up, all of your weight's gonna be on your shoulder. And now a lot of your 50 50s are lying on your legs. I'll use that frame to keep myself stronger, to lock my triangle small to tighter, and I'll be using that to pinch my knees and stay in this position. So again, even if you didn't have the sleeve grip, at some point in time, Dennis is gonna be most likely touching your legs because now he's standing. So I'm gonna get that sleeve grip anyway. If he's standing with his hands in the air, he's not passing the guard, okay? I'm reaching for that sleeve grip. If I can't reach, I'm gonna unlock my triangle, bringing my knee towards me so the grip is closer. Then I'm gonna shotgun and kick and break the grip. The key now is this leg has to be free. I'm using my right foot, the, the, out, the outside of my foot is literally hooking his hip to keep me off the ground. If that foot moves, I'm gonna drop. So it's important that that hooks and that keeps me up. Once I kick and break that grip now, this leg is living in the reach and it's gonna go behind. My butt is not down. I'm still up off the mat hooking. My free leg that fits behind him, my knee is on the, um, my knee that's on the inside is touching his butt. I'll move around and do this two different times so you can see. So when I'm in this position now and I have that hook, all I'm gonna do now is I will drop that, not my hip, I will drop that leg and I'll replace. And now that I'm here, I'll use this grip by pulling my elbow in towards my hip and I'll be bringing my knees towards my chest. To now kick him up, sit him off onto his side, keeping that grip away keeping both of my legs and my hooks flared out so it's hard for him to pummel his legs and not being lazy here. This grip is controlled, this is the first one that comes over. Then I let go, I'll grab my seatbelt, and from there we'll talk about doing a back drill, but then this is where I'm gonna start attacking the back. Let's do this side. So again, more than likely I would already be here. I already see what's going on, I see him stand up. Locking my triangle, I have this grip, I'm breaking the grip if it's necessary. I don't care if he's all the way standing me down, it's all the same, it doesn't matter to me. This leg is literally reaching for that opposite side hook. Keeping my hips up, I'm gonna be placing that leg behind him. All I'm doing now is pulling everything in, kicking, sitting him down, activating my hooks, making sure I don't wanna be here. Because his hand is posed, which means he can circle on his hand, he's gonna face me, nothing is stopping him from turning. Keeping my hooks active. From there, I'll reach over the free grip and grab the collar if you like. Then I come underneath and I can grab the seatbelt. From here, I would probably fall down. I kick him off. I go down. I would start my back take sequence because that's the strongest point to go. Let's do it again. Let's stand up and stay on that knee. Yeah. So you'll see the variation here. If Dennis gets up and doesn't stand up all the way, and he goes here, 
Nothing's different. Breaking the grip, going across, coming on the inside. Sending it inside, right? Lots of variations there. You can use it to go leg drag instead. You can use it to chase like a barambolo instead. But I'm just using the theory again. We're talking about some of my favorite techniques. It's common for me because I play 50-50 to have people stand up. Or it's common for me to feel insecure when he's on top. I don't have a guard to get 50-50 and he's already standing up. So again, if we're getting that position, it's an easy back take. It's also something that um, kind of connects to a lot of other deli heva, 50-50, reverse deli heva, X guard like positions with that hook that's going across there. So there should be a commonality, but the details are the same. Try to use it against them, get to the position and try to use it, right? Is there any questions immediately or no? All right, cool, so take like 20 seconds or so. We'll see if anything pops up and then we'll go to the next one. You know what's you know it's actually ironic? I don't know, I don't know if I'm talking about it, but if you notice more people will ask questions about more common positions, more simple positions, which is good, you know. Is there anything or no? Yep. What's up? Chris Medica, with the hand you're grabbing with the leg, once you get to the crab ride, what are you doing with that hand? So it doesn't matter if you're standing up or not, wherever he goes here. That elbow is always going to be keeping space from from Dennis being able to kind of like square up with me. So stand up, stand up, we get here, we get here, we get here. It's always framed, right? So I'm always keeping it away because if I don't have that grip, I'm not actually controlling that leg too much. Dennis has the ability to kind of move it around a couple of places. So theoretically speaking, if he moves it away, he shows me more of his back, especially because I'm hooked on this leg, right? So if I only had this leg hooked and I hear like this, the only one that can move is this one and if he, comes this way, it's not going to be much. If he goes away, it's going to show you more of his back. So basically what I'm doing is transferring his weight for the option, the capability of keeping him away from me, showing me more of his back. So I'm using that grip and that frame to just keep, keep him away from that. Stand up. So when I'm here and it starts to drop, I'm just keeping this away. Because let's say for some reason I make some mistakes or when I go to a different position, I can use that grip to start chasing and connecting again, right? So um, something that I literally forcefully um, put on my students is that it's my job as a bottom guard player when I'm playing guard and looking to sweep that I need to be able to control a leg and dictate which leg is the bottom because then I can actually sweep. So I try to get away from having any sweeps or any attacks from the bottom that turn into a sweep where I'm not controlling the legs because theoretically speaking, Dennis then has the potential of not getting swept, right? So I try to connect a lot of my sweeps and my sequences with at least all leg or pant control so that this way I know I actually can sweep, right? So like that theory would be like if I play spider, it's really hard to sweep Dennis and keep him down. Why? Because both of his legs are free to move but it's easier to submit him because of my doubling up of grips and I'm just focused on top body, right? If you watch Leandro low and he sweeps, he doesn't have a lot of submission attacks from double pant grip guard, but he sweeps religiously over and over and over again. So what I'm doing here in this variation is that since I've got hybrid grips, which means my one hand is top of the hip and my one hand is on the bottom of the hip, I have a couple of options for submissions and I've got a couple of options for sweeps because I'm able to control the leg, dictate it as the bottom and move forward with it. If I don't keep that pant grip, I feel like that percentage starts, starts to switch, which is where I stay away from that type of situation. Any other questions? K. Santola Tarson asks, is there a size of the partner rule for this move? Um, no, and the reason why I say that is this. If you saw when I pulled my grips and I kicked Dennis, I used to kick people and sit them straight down on top of me. And in fact, I think I was doing this one day at HQ and I kicked someone out and they just like pancaked me. It was actually my fault because I did it. Um, so for me, I got away from kicking someone out and letting them land in a back take and instead kicked them out and landed them on their side. So then I had the opportunity to one, do it on all type of body weights. 
uh, two, have to, I can connect it to wrestling if there's a scramble, right? But I feel that by kicking them out, removes the ability to only do it to certain weights. In fact, I have the, the highest success with this sweep and this back take sequence on bigger people because of their desire to stand up and thinking that I don't have the amount of actual technical control that I do have. For me, this is actually a no brainer. If I had to pick how many people this works on in terms of consistency, I do do this on smaller people, but actually it's higher, it's more higher, it's a higher percentage on people that are bigger than me. So as long as you're not set kicking them out on top of you and you're kicking them away, you're never gonna feel that weight. Chris Matico asks, could you also grab the belt instead of the arm? Yes, you can, but once you let go of the sleeve and you grab the belt, now realize that Dennis is gonna have that hand to address what you're trying to do. The reason why I grab that sleeve is because what I like to do is kind of funnel again, so I can use it to go lasso, I can use it to keep it away, and I realize now that he's only got one free hand to address the position. So the belt is a great option, it is strong, you have a stronger pull, but what'll happen is instead of me sitting him off onto the side, he'll have both hands. Usually what happens is instead of him landing like this, he lands like this and he's trying to run away by showing me his butt, which means my back take sequence and my approach of scram would be a little bit different, but you definitely can. That would look something like this. I stopped this by, by them not having my sleeve and by me punching my underhook on his hip. So even if he gets all the way to my back and I punch behind me into his hip, I can always turn and I stop his hip from being able to follow me around. There you go, right? So if I do get here, Let's show that, let's show that after this too, right? If I do get here, and I go here and here, and I reach up for the belt, I can pull him in, I got a strong pull, but when I go to kick him out, my hand, one of my hands has to come off first to attack the back, okay? I would let go of my belt hand first, because th if this hand comes off, I'm basically riding a bull. I don't mind, but that's up to you, right? So, if I got, kind of reach this grip down, we get a legal grip. So when I got this grip, I would let go here first because at least I can follow his hips. But the problem is, is I'll wait too long here and Dennis will run away. And now we're in this position here because I didn't have control of that hand and I couldn't get a seatbelt. Now I've got to follow up, right? So, yes you can. In fact, what I would probably do, and I'll show that real quick, do the same exact thing. That when I get here and I sit Dennis down and he goes to try and scramble, I just get up and try to move. I would use the belt to then start attacking and looking for something else, right? So, yes, you can grab the belt, but what I would do would be change what takes place from that point forward. It would become a different technique, a different concept, a more unique approach. So, yes, you can use the belt, and just like any other position, once you start changing grips, realize what do I have now and what is it impacting and controlling? And what did I have that it was actually, so like for me, I like the sleeve because of what I can do with the sleeve. I can put my foot in the bicep, I can lasso it, whatever it may be, and I'm using it for my back take sequence, but 100%. Let Dennis real quick show what he's talking about for if I don't have that sleeve, how far are we going? It doesn't even matter. So you can get all the way to here. So this hand is literally reaching for his hip, and I'm just trying to get him in his hip. So I'll just sit here. I'll even bait him to get here. So now from here, thought of that underhook thing, I'm right? Yeah, I'm literally just underhook. So even if he all the way up, I'm here. So at worst case, he kicks me out all the way. I can spin. I might end up in close guard. But it's right behind the back seat. But I just try to find him. Nice. What's up? Rich McKeegan asked, are you worried about them attacking your legs when they are at hip level? No, I actually don't even know where in the sequence you're talking about, but if at any point in time Dennis takes his only hand to attack a leg, he's basically just making a more easy pathway to, to probably attack his back. If he dives for a toe hold or a knee bar, he's exposing his back to, to reach for that, and I feel really confident he's not going to be able to attack any leg lock in that position in terms of stopping me or even threatening me enough to not continue my sequence. I would probably have to know if there's a specific leg lock that you have in mind, but if Dennis's left hand is his only free hand and he's trying to, well, one, he can't toe hold with one foot, I don't think he can do it with one hand from there, but if he attacks a knee bar, 
there's no way because he's gonna have to pull that inside leg all the way through. So let me show you what I'm actually thinking about. He clarified, by the way. Yes, tell me what you clarified. Uh, before entry into X. So when we're... Yeah, like... When uh, we're here? Yeah, I think no. so. So, the, so I'm always worried about this is steam lock from here, and I'm controlling this hand, right? And if I'm not controlling this hand, I'm not moving forward. So if Dennis is attacking like my foot from here, and I see him like, attacking that steam lock, like I'm already like coming out and bailing to avoid that position, right? But again, if I'm here and Dennis's hand is engaged in any shape, way, or form, like I'm literally already addressing that hand. Again, the reason why I'm holding that sleeve is because of what it takes away from Dennis in terms of his options. The only thing I can think of that's outside of that, staying all the way up, Dennis, is that if I go here like this, that Dennis is trying to pull this leg through and try to sit for this knee bar. And I'm not really worried about it because after I get to this position, he can pull that leg all he wants. I'm still gonna sit him down and he's never gonna be able to, and I got this hand. There's no way that he's gonna be able to knee bar me with one leg and one hand. And in fact, I'll like sit him down the opposite way, turn my hip, I can connect, I can switch, and I'll start taking this back again. So from a um, contradicting theory, to be blunt as well, if Dennis doesn't have tempo or control, and I've already got grips and I'm creating a sequence, I, if I was in Dennis's position, would not be attacking when I don't have tempo, because what you'll see that happens is that the position that they get from my attack is usually even worse. So for example, like you see a guy all the time go for a toe hold that's quote unquote shit, and the guy literally takes his back, and now his hands are down, and he probably gets choked therefore after a couple of seconds later, right? So from here, naturally, I'm not seeing anything, and I play a lot of top 50-50 and top reverse belly heave and stuff like this, so my go-to foot locks that I see, other than that bad knee bar attempt, is in a steam lock, and I'm removing all that capabilities away by, by holding that sleeve. Was there anything else? What's the next one, Sasan? Uh, back drill to short choke. Cool, so one of my favorites, so I've been getting really, really into going to seminars and teaching almost the most simple of things that make the biggest difference. Because a lot of times I get people that say, hey, can you come teach a seminar and teach us flying, diving, bear and bolo, squirrel back takes? And I realize that although they're cool and I actually don't do them, but I know I understand them in theory, that they don't make a big enough difference. I literally, with this specific sequence, feel strongly that I've impacted every environment that I've taught it to, including my own. So this is something that's very, very simple and clean. Um, this will help anybody understand back defense, understand back offense. It opens up everything and like it keeps you really, really, really clear in terms of lines, gray areas, where you should back up and like absolute. So when I do this, it's 100% or zero. I don't rationalize it, I don't say what if. If it's not 100% where I want it to be, I instantly fall to the drill, okay? So to simplify this, let's just start on the back and I'll, do it, just sit on your butt, right? So 101, there's three areas of back control, head, shoulders, and hips. For me, I have to have at least two, and they've gotta be high quality, and I can bounce back with those two going to the third one and back and forth. If Dennis is able to go from me having two of those to one, that's his escape and that's his defense, right? What happens is most people are on the back, they think they have the back, they understand that they're there, but they actually aren't in the control that they need to be. And what Dennis is then doing with his escape is again, dropping that below two, and then he's gonna escape, right? So for me, this is very, it's, it's been so simplified now for me that it's like, it's literally black and white. I need to go ear to ear when I'm on his back. The key here when I say ear to ear is like, for me, I literally fold my ear and put it inside his ear. But I'm taking a pencil in my ear and putting it into his ear, and it's not moving, which means it's ear to ear. This is not ear to ear, this is not ear to ear, this is not ear to ear. This is ear to ear. Some people are like, oh, can I be here? Yeah, sure. But if you don't realize that the possibility now exists, then just keep it clean, 100%. No, just ear to ear, right? The second one is my seatbelt. I literally didn't know how to properly seatbelt up until maybe three years ago. Um, and I was already a black belt. I was like the end of my brown belt. Not that I didn't know how to, or I didn't have success from the back, but I definitely wasn't understanding it at the depth that I do now, and I'm sure it's gonna evolve and change again, right? 
Um, so I'll call the details for the seatbelt. Last is the hips. I'm not a huge hip guy. I don't like my hooks. You can triangle if you like, you can body lock, whatever you want to do. But I actually prefer to not have hooks because I'm more of a crucifix guy. But again, my theory and understanding, I still got two of the three, so we're good. Now, to be very, very clear, seatbelt. I was always taught like your seatbelt, right? And in fact, the seatbelt theory is very, very contradicting because the seatbelt goes from your shoulder to your hip, that angle. For me, the seatbelt is literally being here, which means my wrist and my elbow and my shoulder are on the same line. It's like I'm throwing a hook. This is not a hook. This is a different kind of punch. I don't know what it is, but it's not something that I'm familiar with. So I'm being here. The key is this is the minimum. This is a choke. This is a minimum. This is a choke. This is a minimum. This does not work. So I would tell you that if it's not at 90 degrees, and if it's not parallel to the ground, that I start my drill, okay? Here is great, here is the minimum, anything less is not acceptable, right? I like to take my investment, and then I protect my investment, and do a specific grip sequence with my hand to help this out. So again, the key here is I make Dennis mold to me, I do not mold to him. As you can see, with me and Dennis sitting next to each other, Dennis is taller than me, which means if you start with specific sparring in class, and your instructor or you are drilling, you say start on the back, and I literally start here, this is wrong, and because it's not accurate. In fact, when I take the back of any of my sequences, I would already be, probably, somewhere like this. Again, ear to ear in my seatbelt position. So be very, very clear. Here right now, although I have a dominant position, I would tell you in terms of my ear to ear in my seatbelt, that Dennis, is already in a better opportune position than myself. So I will tell you that when you start, what I do is I move my butt back, I create some space, I dig Dennis's grave, and I drop him in that grave, and now I say, wait a second, friend, now we can start specific sparring because this for me is more accurate when I start in the back. This would be bad back principles to start with. This would be the minimum. So be clear with that when you're drilling it or when you're taking the back that you want to already have these boxes checked. So, ear to ear position. I literally fold my ear and I place it inside of his ear. That's my key. I know if I can hear less and I can hear my voice, that my ear's in the correct position. My top hand, again, all in the same line. It's not here, it's here. My other hand is literally, I'm, gra I'm like grabbing inside, grabbing like my pinky knuckle, grabbing, and all I'm doing is literally pulling that up and I'm pulling it back. If my hand drops below and Dennis just puts a thumb on it and drops his elbow down, my muscle group to bring my hand up is nowhere near as strong as his muscle group in keeping that down. You're now gonna have to hand fight, do some different threats to create a more back attack position, okay? I would tell you that this right here is a strong back control with the potential of strong back attacking, but again, this is a maintaining position, ear to ear. So, lots of different things can take place. I only know of a couple of different conceptual escapes, which means Dennis either falls to his side, he either stays here sitting in this very bad position, or he tries to put me on his turtle shell, okay? So, what I do is I don't let Dennis pick any of those. I already know that I'm not submitting him, so what I do is I already funnel to a side of my choice. Let's turn just a little bit. So, what I do, is I pick the side I want to fall to, I prefer to fall down to this side for my drill. I can do both of them, we'll go through both, but it is what it is. So, as I pick the side and I fall down, or Dennis picks the side and he falls down, this leg, in almost every escape that I know, eventually has to hit the mat. When I say hit the mat, I mean from knee to foot. Not from hip to knee, from knee to foot. I don't know of any other escape that Dennis can do where this leg doesn't hit the mat. So my red flag is that if my foot hits the mat, my other leg, my knee doesn't move. Both of my knees don't move. It's just from my knees down to my feet. I'm pummeling this leg behind. I'm literally taking my foot. I'm creating a seat underneath Dennis's butt cheek. So before this leg hits, I literally already pummeling my leg, and then I know it's going to go. I don't let it go, and then I move my leg, and then I get to my sequence. I'm here. I like to keep my feet high and tight, so I'm already going underneath. So if Dennis or I puts that leg on the mat, this leg is ready to go. All I'm doing is I'm kicking him off of me. I do not want him trapping this leg. I need to be mobile, go back a half a step. Sometimes Dennis will put that leg down and stay on top of it. So now I'm stuck and I can't be mobile. 
The key is to use this leg to get him off of that leg. Now, if you notice, and I talk this through all the time, I need to keep his shoulders in a specific position. If I move my elbow away from my hip and I give space, Dennis can theoretically go to turtle, and I'm going to lose the ear-to-ear -ear position in my seatbelt. So the key when I kick is I keep my elbow in close. I'm keeping that shoulder closer to the mat and letting it go further away, staying here. Once I kick him, all I'm going to do is now, like in a, in a counterclockwise position because of the side I'm on, I'm going to walk my, my, my body away, and I'm going to go belly down. And then from here, I'll come up to my knees, I'll be nice to Dennis, but I drag him in, I pick my side, I go back to my position, and I take it back again. And now I'm on this side. So now I know this foot's gonna go behind. So this leg goes down, I kick. Bring that bottom leg, keeping the shoulder back. I do not want him going to turtle. I want him staying close to the mat. Using my feet to go away, to dropping down, to coming back, to placing him again, okay? So I'm gonna do this a couple more times, I'll do it quickly, but the key here, again, if you want a strong, maintaining of back, aggressive back attacks, is that I pick the side, I start the sequence, and I never wait on Dennis. If you are 100% not sure, if you're 99% there, if you're kind of thinking about it, just shut up and then just start the drill. Kick him off, go belly down. No one in the history of back taking has lost the back in that brutal neck cranking belly down back position. I would tell you that when in doubt, go there and live there. In fact, there's submissions there, and I can talk about that real quick, but what you don't want to do is get arrogant and think that you've got something that you don't, and then he gets out. There is never, in my understanding, a, 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 an acceptable reason of being on the back and losing it, ever. And in fact, when I taught this drill, and I've implemented it into an environment, my own and others, and I've watched it, even after two or three days of very small limited drilling, that if you start a blue belt or a white belt who's been drilling this correctly, 60, 70, 80, 90 times, putting some quality time in, and you start him on a black belt's back, that it would be very, very challenging for the black belt to escape. The difference is that in live training, the black belt probably wouldn't even get that deep in a position for him to get his seatbelt from ear to ear. So as an instructor to other instructors, this is a side note, you can test your theories and your concepts because if you do specific sparring, you can check to see if they're true because you should be able to see the value from belt to belt. If in training, you don't do specific sparring, and you see them once in a while get to that position, you can then still see it implemented. But if I bring in Andre and I say, hey, sorry, it sucks, but I have Tommy take your back or someone take your back and start in this really bad position, you should be able to see instantaneously the value because I've already put him in such a bad position. That's how I can check the quality of my position. If I don't start him there, you'll never be able to see it, right? So if he gets there and he can't keep it, then the information is probably wrong or he's a bad student. That's up to you. So again, in theory, when in doubt, kick him, go belly down. I'm going to real quick talk about where I look for my opportunities. Probably tell you my favorite option for here ever, maybe. But we're on a sequence. We're ear to ear. We're here. We drop down. I kick him. I go back. I get you. This is where I assess the situation and I look for my progress and grips, whether it be to, to stitch him up and find a look up. Whether it be to sit him up and look for a short choke. Whether it be to find a position and go from somewhere else. This right here is my starting point for progressing my grips. I don't fight for grips when I'm in a neutral dominant position. A neutral dominant position to me would be being here and me trying to go like this. Is it possible? Yes. Does it work? Yes. But if I'm in this position and Dennis is feeling that pressure and I'm threatening him not only with the position, but in a progress of position, it's harder for him to defend. So when I push him up and I look for the short choke, if he defends the short choke, it's easy for me to pull him back down and take his back. So I'm looking and I'm using the belly down point to not only increase the quality of my back taking position, but to also use it as opportunity to progress my grips to look for more dominant position. Lapel, short choke, <coughs> crucifix, smother, whatever you want to do. I use that time to check myself to make sure everything is correct, okay? So keep this in mind. Again, taking the back, 
getting that seatbelt gear to is super crucial, and then everything else will be a lot easier. I'm telling you right now for a fact, and I hope that there's some people that will later on comment and attest to this information all over the world, that this information in terms of the practicality literally creates a ripple environment immediately, even without drilling it hundreds of times because of what it is. So if there's already questions, cool, we'll take 20 seconds and we'll see if there's any more questions and we'll go on to the next one. Sasan, what time is it? 1.25. Cool. Right on board. That was number four. Five. Four or five? Five. Yep. Yeah. Any questions? Chris Matico asks, could you go over your hand position for shoulder control and what's more dominant? Cool. So my preference again, and I like to be right hand dominant, is that that right hand is coming over and keeping it on that line. So again, you can see that I'm kind of at the AC joint with this hand. The higher it goes, the more of a threat there is for the choke, which is great. In fact, in that belly down position, if my grip is high enough, you can actually tap people. I've done it before, there's videos of it. I can show it to you after this if you like. Um, but I keep that hand at least that high. Again, on the same frame of my elbow. Now, if I were to be in a bad position, for example, not in an ear-to-ear -ear position, you can see how high my elbow is because of the height difference, which means it's really hard for me to keep this hand up. So by being in the proper ear-to-ear -ear position, my elbow can be in the proper position for my hand to be in the proper position. The key now is what I do is I use my, my left hand, my pointer finger, my left hand, and I grab and I protect all my knuckles and I literally grab my hand and all I'm doing is pulling that elbow back and then connecting my elbow to my ribs. I don't like that being out here, I don't like it being down because sometimes if I drop my elbow down, my hand will go down. I'm always in a constant state of pulling it up. So the key here is I'm keeping my elbow up and I'm pulling it in towards me. That's going to also greatly impact what Dennis can do with his left arm and his shoulder. And there's like a funnel sequence from here. I do like a, uh, an arm trap. I do like crucifixes from here. But for me, that's key. What you'll notice is that when you kick people off, this happens all the time, is that if you are properly pulling Dennis's shoulder in, he'll go turtle. Because now there's space between your chest and his and your seatbelt's allowing him to rotate his shoulder. The key is to use the rotation of his shoulders to not let him get out of the position. So if you want to funnel him to go to turtle, when I kick him, I can use that elbow space to move his shoulder away, but I don't want that. So be really clear, if you're doing this drill and Dennis is getting to his knees, that means that your seatbelt is off. And because your seatbelt is off, you will then lose head position, you'll lose the position entirely, you'll be on top maybe with a shit seatbelt or something like that, or maybe not at all, but it's up to you. The key is to always control the lining of his shoulders. I keep them closer to the mat than away from the mat unless you want to go turtle, but for me, I'd rather just stay in the back and crucifix from there. So again, it doesn't matter what side you're on, that hand is high, that elbow is high, they're at the same point on his shoulders. One's not up and one is down, or vice versa, they're both here. The higher you can keep your hand, the more that shoulder comes up, the better. This for me is not acceptable. Again, you can see my hand is lower. He's gonna start hand fighting, it's gonna get back. It's gonna get worse, he's gonna start trapping stuff. I'd rather be here. He should be as uncomfortable as physically and mentally as possible in this proper position. It should make a huge difference. Is there anything else or no? Nope. No? Okay, what's the next one? Um, <laughs> best pass in the best world. Best pass in the world. Strongest pass in the world, right? So uh, I had a couple questions um, because one, I've taught this at a couple seminars. Two, because people were asking me. But um, the details for this pass are very strong. And in fact, it's also one of my favorite passes to do, especially when I'm inside or not using my lapel pass sequence type of situation. So um, this is something that we do a lot at the academy. So it's been, is there a question? Yeah. Oh, what's the question? Yeah. Uh, Brad Bentley asks, you mentioned crucifix. Do you have a preferred entry from that belly down scramble position? Yes. So we're gonna get here, right? When I'm in this position, I, I usually do two things. Now I can do my crucifix from turtle, which is fine. So like if we were, I'll turn this way, sorry. So if we were here, I would let him go. So as he goes, I'm bringing that knee on the inside now, rotate. I bring that knee on the inside, right? I'm all about that. And it's easy for me now to like trap, fall down, kick, and I've got my crucifix, right? So 
I love the crucifix and I love doing it from the turtle, which is a common place for me to do it. But when I'm here, I will go from a specific position, which is just my arm track sequence. So basically what happens is I go here, I'll come up, I'm reaching for that hand, pinky knuckle, I think we've talked about this, Brad. And I look for the short choke sequence. So now that I'm here, I'm gonna place him down. I come up, and I step across. So just turn this hip so you can see. Yep. So now that I'm here, I'm fighting. Dennis will defend the short choke. I use that time now to trap his arm. I come back, but I don't like it. But that arm is trapped. And in fact, my foot is behind his back, similar to like that, that seat that we had. So I go more, I take my leg off. If he doesn't go, it's fine. I can kick him. If he does go, it's even easier. So if he goes, let him go. All I do is I bring my foot into my butt. There's my crucifix, and I go back to my attack position. Come pop back over. If he doesn't go and he tries to stay on my leg, I use that foot to lift him off, to pull him back in, to go back to my sequence again. So the crucifix sequence for me, if I'm already on the back, is gonna be an arm trap final. If I were to be passing, or I were to be not have that back take position, I'm attacking it from turtle. And that arm trap sequence, and I think we did this triple, we'll just go triple. Anytime he's here, I can take his back. I already have a seatbelt, and that knee's on the inside. It's toes on the bicep, and all I'm doing is pinching, falling down, and keeping that connection, and then locking. I do, in my all of my favorite things DVD, talk about having like double overs. And the only reason why I knew this and I started doing it was because I was preparing to fight Garrett, so I thought he was going to do it to me, which he did, just for a different position. Is that if I'm in this position, I go double overs, at some point in time, all I do is I just pick a side. And then all I do is I connect. And after I connect, I switch. So if you're into crucifix stuff, Brad, there are a couple of different crucifix uh, conversations on the All My Favorite Things DVD, but if you want to see anything that's specific crucifix, more in depth, let me know, I'll post some stuff for you and I'll send it to you. But to, sh to, answer your an to answer your question, if I'm already on the back, I take the crucifix from that arm trap sequence. If I'm not on the back and I'm scrambling or I was trying to pass and then he went turtle, then I'll go turtle and trap his arm. But if I'm on the back, I don't let him go turtle. Is there anything else or no? Nope. All right, cool. So, strongest pass in the world. Now, there's thousands of ways of getting here. It's yep. best to... Oh, listen, that <laughs> Can you go over a few details to finish the technical stand-up suite from De La Hiva? Oh, yeah, we can do that later. We'll do that next time at the end. Okay, go, yeah. uh, let me, um, should I complete that? Let me go bottom half. Best here. pass in the world. Yeah, so you can get here a lot of different ways. Uh, at first, I was stuck here and did this pass because I was stuck. Then I saw the value of it, and what I would do is I would funnel Dennis, someone, whoever I'm going with, to this position to do this pass. So there's plenty of opportunity to do this. This is like a knee cup position, a half guard position, a quarter guard position, whatever you want to call it. But these grips are super, super strong. And again, we're going to use this in depth. I think you asked the question earlier, but if Dennis can't do a technical stand up, he's unable to sweep me. So what I'm doing is controlling his bottom leg, never letting that leg go behind his rear hand. So theoretically speaking, if I just want to stall, it's a great stall position, okay? So, real quick, let's just do some magic. We could be in Deli Diva. I can push down, I can step, I can get to this position, right? We could just be reverse Deli Diva, like I kick, push, and I come to this position. We could have been on our knees, traditional half, traditional half bar, which I don't like to do. You can be hip clamp, you can be in regular position, whatever it may be. I'll really get up, I'll get to this position anyway, right? Hip clamp, hand on the hip, step, inside, outside, or back in this position, you can drop down, do whatever you like. Anytime that I'm in shit across the leg, this is my go-to pass, 100% of the time. In fact, I funnel people to hear a lot for the inside pass. What I'm looking to do, my right leg, which I'm using my right hand, I'm using my right hand, if my butt's in the way, I'll move, but what I'm doing is I'm looking for this right hand pant grip on his bottom leg. I will go as low as I can to grab the pants, I fold the pants, I keep a four finger grip, I roll it into a fist, I make sure my fist is square, this is not as great, this is not as great, this is not as great. I roll that grip, I keep my grip strong, okay? I'm in this position now. My left hand, it's crucial to grab the same side lapel, okay? And I'll change angles so you can see both. Grab the same side lapel. I do not grab behind his head, I do not grab low around his pec, I grab at his AC joint again. If for some reason Dennis has his sleeve, all I'm doing is pulling my hand over the top, 
breaking the grip, grabbing the lapel, and then starting again. If I go to reach any blocks, again, I circle my hand, come down, and grab. I need both these grips to start the sequence and eating a specific spot. Okay? Once I've got this grip now, what I need to do is understand the pass sequence. So I need to be able to control Dennis's shoulders. Because why? In this sequence, I want to pass and take his back. I mean, I want to pass to side control, right? If I want to take his back, it's going to be a different position. So when I'm passing, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the uh, 90 degree rule. If Dennis's shoulders are at 90 degrees or more, it's a back take. If they're at 89 degrees or less, it's side control. So depending on where I put my head and how I use it, it will dictate my option. So I've got the lapel, so now I place my head. I can feel that Dennis's top shoulder now is less than 90 degrees, which means this pass is gonna end up in side control. So I do not look away, I do not look down. I use the top of my hairline and I look through his body, here. Once I'm here, I pick my butt up, and all I'm gonna do is turn my knee as much as I can in the same direction of his knee. The key is this is not good enough, this is good enough. I relax my foot, and now all I'm gonna do is slide out. Once my foot slides out, I turn my hips down and look at through. And all I'm gonna do now is floss. I drive, I drive, I drive, and I get here. A lot of the times, depending on your version or how you like to do it, Dennis is always gonna be using his hands to try and finish the position or change it. So if I see that elbow on his ribs, I will solidify the position, get my points, and now I will use that frame against him, frame on you really hard, Dennis, to then drive up my other hook. If he doesn't frame on me, let's say he's trying to run away, he's trying to get away from me, I can use this lapel to pull him down. Stabilize his side control, come over the top, switch and go hip check. So let's do the pass again, just from a different angle so you can see the grips. We're in this position, that right hand is below, grabbing the pants super low, reaching for the lapel. He blocks the grip, I can circle, break the grip, grab the lapel, and put my head down. Do not look down, look through. This is the key, look at his knee, it's pointing away. It's not pointing this way, it's pointing away. I pick my butt up, I turn my knee in the same direction, slide out, up on my toes, driving. Boston coming inside. If I see that frame, drive towards it, jack it up, right? There's a lot of different things that are gonna happen here, which is why this is like a sequence, and I don't wanna teach the whole sequence. But most of the time, this is literally what takes place. So if your head position is off, and you're grinding and you're grinding and grinding, you need to keep your head on the top shoulder to flatten him out. I pull the lapel as I drive my head. That's gonna turn his shoulders down. The key here is that if he uses his bottom shoulder to get away, you gotta pull the lapel. If he uses his top shoulder to push, you gotta push your head back. So, if Dennis pulls, you pull. If he pushes, you pushes. You push, right? That's the balancing act of that situation. There are back takes, back takes here, there are different uh, circumstances that will happen, but they're more in depth and come after this. But again, the sequence is shown in the DVD. If you guys have any thoughts, we can talk about it, but this pass sequence is super, super strong. Remember, at any point in time, Dennis tries to bail, tries to stand up, I'm literally holding that pant. That leg is not going anywhere. If he wants to turn and use his other leg, his bottom leg, he's gonna show his back, he's gonna be in a really bad bar type position. So this pass is literally one of the strongest technical passes that I know in the sense of the grip integrity, what it impacts, size, whatever it may be. This works on big, small, whatever it may be. If you have a big guy, you some a small guy, he dies. So this literally, again, this pass specifically changed the environment in my own academy to where people were only doing it for long periods of time, only drilling it, and literally it just like, it happened, people were like, well, how do we stop it, whatever it may be, but it was a huge impact in my academy. It's very, very high level pass. I taught this in a couple of seminars and I had people reach out and say, man, I won the tournament with that, blah, 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 whatever maybe, but strong, strong sequence. Again, one of my favorites, but it's, for me, it's one of the strongest passes in jiu-jitsu. Is there any questions? 20 seconds if there's not. <clears throat> cool, 20 seconds, we'll wait. What's the next one, though? Um, I'm gonna apply to drills with options. And then what's after that? Is there anything after that? That's nope. the last one, right? Cool. Is there any questions or no? You mentioned the back take. Uh, over the 90 degree line, yep. what would one be? Okay, so you get here, you get here, you get here, I get here, I go like this. A uh, common thing that Dennis will do because his top leg is free, so he uses his top leg to stop me from getting my hip in, right? That's also going to give him the ability to start moving around, right? So he blocks my hip like that, what I do is I back up. 
But when I back up, you see that 90 degree line now with the shoulders. But I, since that leg drops down, I then staple it. And once I staple it, I can relocate my head. It should come over the top. Then you start circling, taking it back. There's a lot of different variations that get here. There's a lot of different situations that can happen. But what you'll see is they'll both evolve. So like if, if Dennis showed this on me and then you start hitting it during training, my mind is like, well, how do I stop this pass? Usually, in my experience, the first, the first response to this pass is that top leg that's free starts trying to block the pass with the hip. He tries to use his hands somehow, some way, but that leg is a major part of his response to the situation. But then you'll see that if he does a good job of stopping the pass up, it's because he's giving his back. And then I can really connect that and go to the back, or I'll connect to the back and I'll fail, and then I'll use it to do a different passing, whatever it may be. But there's a couple of different A, B, C's that will happen in this sequence that are really based upon how much tempo you're controlling on top and what the person on bottom does. Nine times out of 10 for me, even when he still gives me a strong response, I can still pull and push and I'll still flatten him out and I'll floss and I'll grind and I'll get him into side control. So it really just depends on what you actually want. You can start funneling him a little bit more, encouraging him, the shoulder line. But there's a couple other sequences that can be in there too. De uh, Kyle does one where he'll lace the leg and then he'll do a ninja roll from there. But like, there's a lot of different variations you can do. Is there something else or no? Uh, Jorge Law says, killer stuff, Christian. You're nice. the man. Uh, hope to see you soon. And how can we donate? Nice, very sweet. Um, appreciate that. Try not to answer any questions that are not related. But um, if you, this video was shared to my personal Facebook page. Um, there's a Venmo link, there's a PayPal link. The Venmo link is at Christian dash Woodmancy. The PayPal is admin at Christian Woodmancy. If you are not sure, go to my page, copy the information, and then paste it. Um, there's also the DVD that I am kind of showing information from, which is called All of My Favorite Things. It is available in physical copy, stream, and download. That link is also in there. After this video is done, as soon as it is done, I will end the live. I'll put all of this information in the post, in the everywhere, so that you can have it too. So again, if you can't donate right now, cool, don't worry about it. If you want to wait to the end to see some information, cool, whatever it may be. But the key here is that if you can't donate, just share. And if you can donate, awesome, I really appreciate it. But don't worry about it, it's not the main focus. Um, we'll have all the information up for anybody who wants to donate, just be patient because I really sucked at trying to put this all together in the last minute. So, um, but yeah, thank you for the, the information. Any questions about the back take stuff that we just did from there? No? Okay. So, one more drill for, for me to do, something I like to do a lot and talk about some options, is omoplata flow drill. For me, I was always told that if I'm attacking an omoplata and I'm going for the submission, I will get the sweep. If I don't attack the submission and I attack the sweep, I usually get nothing. So what I've learned to do is get my grip set up and really attack the shoulder so they avoid the submission by giving me a couple of different reactions and then I'm ready to go to attack them from there. So I'll just show you a sequence that I do. There's two drills that I do from here actually. One is like omoplata to re re omoplata. It's just a flow back and forth from side to side. And then there's also a guillotine uh, drill as well. So um, let's just, for sake of conversation, need you to roll so your head is going to be, yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna take an omoplata. So Dennis is facing you right now, right? So when I go omoplata, I've got a lot of different grips, but whatever it may be, when I get this position, this grip may be here, this grip, <laughs> This grip may be here, it may be here, wherever it may be. But whatever leg is over, this hand for me always comes to the elbow and then I mirror his form with my forearm. So it doesn't matter what grips I have in terms of my opposite hand, this grip always comes here because I know if he does roll, if he does something, I have control here. This also keeps me locked in tight, keeps my hips strong and everything else like that. So when I'm here, I'm just just for sake of conversation, I probably actually have this grip here like this. When I attack the shoulder, he rolls out of it. I'm already here. Now it's turning a little bit just right there. Good. So if you've ever actually watched someone bow plot of someone, this is a common response, which is the forward roll. If I were not to be holding Dennis's elbow and I put both my hands on that, please watch how Dennis would get up and escape. So what you're seeing is that he's taking the elbow on the inside, he's pulling it to the mat, he's in a little bit of a hip escape, and he's pulling it out. He's getting up. So what happens is when I teach this, people might be like, oh, then I won't do that, but then you won't escape, so you stay down, it's fine, right? So my theory is to control this elbow, I keep my elbow glued to his wrist, 
And what I do is I keep that elbow up as high off the mat as possible, try to escape now from that position. Now it's theoretically, if I keep that elbow, he's never gonna do that escape I showed you. So he's got three options. Do that escape. If I'm holding that, he can stay here. Or the third option would be to go that way and we're going right back into an omo plata. So by controlling this elbow, I'm definitely greatly restricting what he can do. If I let go of that elbow, he can do all three, it's even harder for me to say. So what I'm doing is I'm keeping that elbow. So the first one is just a guillotine drill that I like to do. I keep that elbow up. I'm actually turning, my left hip is off the mat, my right hip is on the mat, I'm facing him. I put my hand on the mat, what I do is I switch my hips really hard, really quick, and then I face him again. So that motion really slow as I pick my hip up, I go away, and then I face him again. What I'm doing is I'm keeping his elbow down, but I'm giving him some space. Remember, he wants to get up. If he goes to get up, he says, nah, never mind, he'll just stay down. Sounds good, I will come up, that's called a sleep. We'll talk about that as well. But I give him that space. So I know this hand's coming up, this elbow's in the back is coming up. When I let go of that, I literally take my elbow off and I keep my hand here just like this. Because I know what's gonna happen is it's gonna be a chin strap, it's gonna be looking for my guillotine. My free hand is gonna be looking to push him into that hole where his head is gonna go. So as he gets up, I really hit his ear and I put it right into that hole. I can connect my hand, comes over the top and I hit my guillotine, right? No information that needs to go in deep theory, but like, I don't like to be, so like, Josh Hinger, a great friend of mine, is the guillotine master. I do not have many of his guillotine details because I suck at guillotines. But when I guillotine from here, I'm grabbing, I'm grabbing my hand. I actually prefer to get this grip here. So what I'm doing is I do a grip with my fingers just like this, okay? So when I get this grip here and I go here, all I'm doing now is I bring my grip up and over his head. Because now, if Dennis goes to check my hip and jump over to side control, I can still tap him out with the guillotine. So this is like a Marcelo, Garti, uh, Marcelo Garcia elbow up guillotine like position, right? So like, I just keep my grips like this so I can get my elbows really close. That variation is up to you. You don't have to do grip variation, you just do chin strap, you can do regular grip, you come over the top. This flow drill is really, really smooth. We'll do it a little bit faster so you can see, just lay down, right? Try to get a little resistance. He tries to get up. He's not getting up. In fact, I sit really hard on my, my hip to make sure he can't hit his hip. So I can solidify here if you want to. I can transfer the grip, place my hand down, get that elbow away, and start coming up, mild plotting, pushing across. Lots of strong position for here, right? I'll control. I go away, I push, I come inside. Push, I go over the top. Super simple. If you're someone like uh, my other black belt, Kyle, Instead of letting go and going for this, I'll grab the lapel, I'll push, and you can go inside for your loop choke, right? You go inside for your loop choke, whatever variation you like. So, gi or no gi, it's up to you. Strong position, so do the whole thing a little bit smoother, right? Here, move away. Boom, inside that position. Throw my leg over, finish the guillotine. Go to side control, finish the guillotine, whatever it may be. You can also keep your leg and step in, sit him over, come back on top and sweep him if you ended up on the bottom with your guillotine, right? So it's all there. So, to be clear with you, I like this grip a lot. This is what I do when I lose the omoplata and I end up in this side control butt down position. Another drill that I do, it's a common thing you can see with his arm, is this arm, this elbow is always gonna be off of his ribs to get up. I don't know if anybody gets up like this, right? So what I do is when I free some space, I see that arm coming across, I literally pull it inside. And all I do now is I hit the skate across, and as he gets up, I put my leg up and over, and I go right back to the pommel plot, and I turn my head into position again. So now he goes to roll, and I can turn into this position. I go away, I see the arm, and I literally come back to the top, and I grab it. So I literally have two smooth drills from this position, which is just going to be going into another attack, re-attacking with a stronger attack, whatever it may be, but just try to keep it smooth, right? Like, I also triple dipping now have a pure Omo plot of DVD. Both these drills are on there, but I did my all my favorite things DVD before the Omo plot of focus, and this is also on there, but for people that are smaller, for people that play spider guard, you get to a lot of, you get to more Omo plotas, or you get to a triangle that fails, you go Omo plata. So the key is that if you're getting to an Omo plata out of failure, that you're able to still use it for success, use it to sweep, get to side control, use it to get to a DT, whatever it may be. What you don't want to do is go arm bar, triangle, omoplata, and then you lose a position, you're back on bottom, you've got nothing, right? So the key here is that understanding is how can I never hit a dead end? And this is a drill to show that, drill to show that, but um, for me these drills are really fun as well. You've got lots of movements. 
and the person on bottom is not really making any mistakes. So like theoretically speaking, you can say like, well, you can sit there and do nothing. You can get re plotted or you can try to escape. So it's very, very clear authentic conversation. So if there's not any initial questions, we'll wait 20 seconds, then we're gonna get into something else. So while anybody's thinking, so that right there is everything that I wanted to show did about like an hour and a half because I don't really have anybody to, to check, but um, that's what I wanted to show. So what I'm now gonna get into is I've got uh, questions that were previously sent to me that had nothing to do with what we just showed, but some of them may kind of connect. So um, if anybody has any questions on what we just went over, start typing them now and send them. I'm gonna wait a little bit longer. If not, we're gonna go into the Q&A, and there's probably gonna be Q&A within that Q&A, but we're gonna bank through these really, really smoothly so we can get as much information as possible. Are there any questions initially or no? Uh, could you show the loop choke option again? Yeah. So when I'm in this position here and I go to go away, don't move yet, right? I, when I go away and I sit here, th this hand never really comes off. So my elbow is really close to my hip and I go away. So this is like me saying like, hey, get, get this guillotine here, right here, right? So the only difference now is instead of reaching for his chin, wherever it may be, I'm just looking for that cross collar grip. No hand is going to be in my way to fight that because if his hands are in the way to fight that, he's not getting up. So the key here is that you're obviously looking for that position. I would be using my left hand to grab the lapel to already feed. The key here is because of the, the position is you're already underneath his chin. Just don't be up here. Just keep your elbow down. So when I reach, I don't reach with my arm. I just turn my hand. And all I'm doing is turning and I'm just feeding inside. So when he comes up, the loop is already going to be there. There's different variations of loop. I'm not a looper. In fact, I would say like, hey, like maybe reach out to Kyle to get some details. But like for me, my loop is just pushing him inside that, and I just come over the top here. This is actually probably one of the most common ones that, that Kyle does as well. Because if the key here, though, is what you want to realize they don't have any control on his knee or his hip line. So his defense would be putting his back in the mat again. So like you can track his leg if you want. You can throw your leg over the back. A loop choke is basically a D version of a guillotine. So if you want the submission, you've got to stop his ability from clearing your hip or from rolling out of it, right? If you want to use it as a sweep and I go to attack, you know he's going to fall over, you can then use it to come back up, right? So the key there is that heating or a loop choke, my hand is only moving and I'm grabbing whatever I like or I'm grabbing the chin or I'm grabbing my hand. Don't move your elbow reaching for the position because that's going to definitely impact what's going on. But what you'll start to see is that you'll reach for something and the person may say, well, now I don't want to come up because I see that threat of a choke, whatever it may be, but now they stay down. So don't forget that you're still getting your sleep and now you're in some kind of version of side control, so make sure you stay focused there. Philip Stoops asks, is there an option for a reverse arm bar rather than the omoplata on the other arm? Um, yeah, but, but with the grip that I have, it's going to be really hard because what I'm doing is with the grip that I initially get on the elbow, I'm keeping Dennis his ability away from moving his elbow out. So it would be hard for me to underhook and attack it like a just go over here, come up. So when I when I'm here like this, it's really hard for me like to to get underneath and start attacking that. So if I were to go here and I want to start attacking an armbar, I then have to start changing my position, right? And then yeah, you can start attacking arm bars and bird arm bars or whatever else it may be. You will see, and I think this may be actually what he's asking, roll, that you may get here, and Dennis, yeah, Dennis goes to reach for that underhook, and instead of pulling it in, you could pummel underneath. And then from there, what I can do is I can take my hand off, and I can hit the skate, but I've got to track that arm, and now I can attack the straight arm bar. So now as I go to attack it, you can come up like this to start to fight it, and then look back to your own product. But again, is it something that's high? No, it's definitely possible. I wouldn't attack that arm bar unless there was no time I was losing or I'm 100% sure I'm controlling that, that arm so he couldn't get up to then be in a position to defend the inverted arm bar. But it's definitely, it's definitely viable from that one transition. But other than that, I would just commit to the grip that I have because I feel like I have more options with more control. That's it. Okay. All right. So um, appreciate you guys listening to that aspect. Um, now we're going to get into some of the questions that I've got. Uh, I'm going to break these down as much as I can. Some of these are a little bit more advanced or simple, so be patient. But I think there's 10, right? I simplified 10. By the way, Craig, 
Um, and anybody else that waited until after we started, it's okay, but like it's gonna be hard because I literally had probably like just from 24 to 48 hours, like 80 questions, so it's really hard to kind of accumulate everything. But what's the first one? Number one, quarter guard, pass discussion. Cool, so this is my boy Cameron in, in Idaho, SPG, right? So Cameron said to me, like, hey, I'm gonna cut this Lucas, caught in this Lucas Lake quarter guard position. He's got specific grips. So I'm gonna go into a theory, break this down, share my point of view, and it is what it is from here. So this quarter guard is literally just my foot being completely captured. Cameron was saying to me that he had, oh, turn this way, so I can see. Turn all the way, yeah, 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 yeah. Good, right there, cool. Cameron was saying to me that he had this lapel, and it was about this shoulder level, it wasn't low, and he had this sleeve, okay? So I asked him where his elbow was, I asked him what he was doing, there's a lot of things here. For me, when I see people with these grips, these grips are run linear to that best, strongest pass in the world thing that I was doing. This hand initially is where my head was. So for me, if I have this grip, what I'm trying to do is push with this grip. This is gonna be a flatten out grip in this particular position because this hand is pulling up. This hand grip is stopping the hip escape. So what, what I'm doing is keeping Dennis's ability away of hip escaping. So initially then what I want him is flat, right? If he keeps his elbow down and I keep the grip, it's definitely gonna slow things down. But for me, this is like one of these push pull positions. So for me, what's very common is people literally do this thing, they do this thing, they do this thing, and then they do this thing, right? That's easier said than done. I actually know, Cameron, you are tall, you're long, so that, that space is a little bit different. My input would be, if you like this pass and you wanna flatten him out, you can do a couple of different things. One would be, obviously, tilting, replacing onto his hip, then turning your knee, replacing where your knee was with your hip, and then you can literally pull out or use your free foot to kick. If you're still stuck there, he's flat, or at any point in time he's flat and you can't do that, your foot is stuck, I will literally pick all of my weight up and I'll put my knee across his hip to the opposite side. And he can keep the foot if he likes. But now that I have this, this can be thrown across, I can look for his back. If he wants to stay flat, he can. And now I'll either use that position now to get down to hook, to then open up. And instead of passing for three, I will pass for seven to nine. So what I would tell you is one, particularly I'm not fond of doubling up my grip like that in that pass sequence. I was always taught that like in that particular pass, you put like your head on their chin and grind and do some other stuff, right? But I know people that do that like punch, pull, heavy, heavy opening of your chest to pass in that position, but it requires Dennis to be flat. And you can flatten him out in numerous different ways by either placing your elbow on his hip, placing your ribs on his ribs, pushing his shoulder down, but he needs to be flat. If Dennis is able to be on his side, or he's able to keep his legs locked to the point where you can't get him out and he's flat, I literally just jam and go all the way across. There's not a single thing that's stopping you from doing that. If for some reason, let's go back down real quick. If for some reason you're here and like you feel like you, this hand is stopping this knee from going across, this hand is coming off and it's driving underneath from an underhook. And in fact, I wouldn't even try to pass anywhere. I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna step, and all I'm literally gonna do is pick my hips up and I'll turn. He can keep my leg in there and I'll connect the tunnel, go to my Kimura, and use a Kimura to get my leg out, take the back, or I'll just literally rip his arm off from here. So for me, what I will do is I'll just kind of like check off some variations of like, hey, cool, like you're flat, for some reason you're still keeping my foot. I would switch the position so he keeps the foot and changes the threat. If he opens up to push the knee away, I'm gonna grab an underhook. But I would say, take in mind, do you actually want side control? If you do, he's gotta be flat. And make sure you make him flat before you get your foot out. That will actually help you get your foot out. If you can't get your foot out, he's flat. Take him to another flat position, which would be mount. And in fact, now, if he wants to defend mount, he's gonna show his back. We've already got one hook. So like, you're really saying like, hey, like, pick your poison, what do you wanna do? You need to be able to use those grips efficiently. So if you're getting those grips and you can't flatten him out, I would say to you that they're just done at the wrong time or you just gotta literally make sure you're sharpening that up to make sure it's happening right away. But that's my input for that Lucas Lake uh, guard position. Or 
I would take my hand off the collar, grab the pants, and I would do the best pass, strongest pass in the world. So that's just my opinion. But um, I like that pass. I know a lot of people pass that way. It's more of a traditional style. It's definitely, if you got some size on you, it's good. But it's all about chest and hips. So if you can't flatten out and open up your chest, it's going to be really hard to get your foot out. So I'll wait a second to see if anybody has anything to say about that. And then we'll go to number two. Hopefully that helps, camera. Two is a surf pass, right? Cool, no questions? Go down. All right, so something that I'm fond of that I do very much, someone asked about because they're doing it as well, it's going to be called surf passing. So surf passing is like very, very fluid, very, very high movement. There's like a highlight reel of me passing this way at like a fight to win, right? So um, I'm really fond of using people's grips against them. So this can happen in one of two ways. I could be in Dennis's guard and I could break down like 90% of it and then I could let him have that 10% of his grip and I can use it against him to surf pass, or I can just put it on the outside, I can surf pass and do all the time from both situations. So the key with any surf passing is that wherever I'm trying to put my body to stabilize my pass, whether it's knee on belly, whether it's side control, wherever it may be, or mount, is I need to open up that space to put my body into it. So my preference on surf passing is to go to knee on belly, um, but there's surf passing to side control or surf passing to mount as well. You wanna be fluid and kind of always go with the flow. So, to show you from two different variations, Dennis can be like in belly hema, right? He's got like a collar. And like I already see that even though Dennis has the collar, he's not doing a great job with it. Like it doesn't have as much integrity as he, as he wants. So kind of use that ploy against him. This is something that I do with people that I feel there's a level difference between us. So I feel confident. If I literally feel like we're on the same level, they're better than me, I always break the script. So keep that, keep that very much in mind. So I'll push this down, I'll kick, and I'll literally like come to the outside, right? Letting him have the collar, okay? Turn a little bit this way. Move over here, son. Yeah. Good, right? So what you're seeing now is that there's a huge chunk of window between Dennis's right elbow and his right hip. That just so happens to be where I'm gonna surf pass to. If he doesn't have that lapel, that space may not be there. So whether I got him to here and he already had this, or sometimes what I literally do is like sit here like this and I'm really put and he'll reach for it. But whatever space opens up is where my surf pass is gonna go. So whatever it may be, how do you get there? I prefer to surf pass when he has a collar grip, doesn't matter which one to me, but be very careful. If he grabs my cross collar, I sit heavy over here because I can definitely feel the setup of the collar drag. If he's got same side collar, I don't even remarkably care because that has zero value in my posture for my shoulder rotation. So you want to be careful here in terms of what grip he has and what you're going to do. I like setting this up from over here. I like being off on the side because the heavy shows uh, what he can do. Here's a little bit harder for me, right? So, doesn't matter what collar grip he has. What I like to do is I take my same side grip hand and I either hold his elbow or I grab the D and I trap his elbow. But what I want to do is make sure again, when I get that space, I keep that space away from it so I just trap it, right? So I'm in this position right here, all I'm gonna do is I put my hand down and I'm basically a technical stand-up, right? I'm in a technical stand-up. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my, my shin to his hip and then I'll jump forward into this position. And now I can push forward and I've got this position. Now, usually what happens is we'll go to hip escape, that hand will go down, I can push, I can press. So do my other magical flowing around stuff, right? So let's do it again, kind of like an all one sequence. So you got a right? Belly deep line here, I push, I kick, I break him down, I go, and I step, right? I'm basically using the grip against him here. This is something that we talk about a lot at my academy too. Dennis definitely has something with the collar, but he's not doing what it's meant for. Dennis is definitely in a dangerous position. He shouldn't be just sitting here like this. He's giving me a lot of space. He should either be sitting up and getting to a better position or pulling me into a better position. But by staying there, he's actually, it's like being on the top of the hill and I've got guns and he's trying to come up. I'm definitely in a better position of the two. He's gonna be really, really careful. But I wouldn't trust Dennis to not try and collar drag me. So if he's got cross collar, I sit off really hard on the side over there. I can see him try to switch his hip. I can see the opportunity for an underhook and kind of move from there. If he's got same side collar, I could care less. So I know he's not gonna be able to pull me as much. In fact, if he does pull, it's gonna make it worse for him later on. So we can definitely surf pass a couple of different ways. Sometimes simply just being in this position, like I said, I'll, like, I'll lean forward, there it is, and I'll step and I'll go. I prefer, again, to go knee on belly type side control position. I know people that simply just go right to side control. I know people that try to 
Uh, Kyle will literally jump armbar, jump triangle on you from these positions. So the surf pass setup definitely applies to multiple different options and possibilities, but it's definitely something you want to think about if you're a bottom guard player and a top guy when you're in a neutral position, the surf pass is a very viable option. See if anybody has no? Okay, cool. Wait a couple of seconds. What's number three? Stuck in bottom side. All right, so someone reached out to me. Um, actually, I had a couple people reach out to me. They kind of were all ran linear, but <laughs> bottom side control, I get a bottom side control, I get bottom side control. I am probably the last person to ever ask this question to because it's very challenging for me to understand and I don't even want to get into it, right? So in terms of escapes, there's, there's so many more viable options and focal points that you should be looking into before trying to understand an escape. An escape is accepting bad position first and then learning how to do something from there. For me as a person who was very small, I spent a lot of time on bottom side control because I was always the smaller person playing guard or getting, getting just mauled over and then getting put side control. Side control is the result of, of when you're playing guard, a very, very late or lack thereof understanding of guard retention. You should never be landing in side control and be stuck in side control. And what's happening is most people compartmentalize and say, what is the technique now to getting out? And if you want to have higher level jujitsu, you should be thinking, well, how do I actually not even go in, right? So like, it happens a lot, I understand it. And in fact, I almost think that it's better egotistically for you to not have the tricks and escapes to get out of side control because it should motivate you to not go there in the first place. When I'm training, if I'm training with someone, I get put in side control, I literally mentally break, give up, and I say, I lost, there's no point in even escaping because my jujitsu is awful. So it's something you want to consider. It's not what you have to do. I'm not trying to be rude, but for a smaller person that loves jujitsu, my dignity, my ego is the fact that you can't pass, you shouldn't pass, you shouldn't be in bad positions. And I stay positive and I say, how can I make them better so I don't go there? Rather than saying, well, you know what? I'm getting my guard passed and I'm getting inside control. How do I get out and take advantage of it? I'll tell you that both are good, but one is great and I'd rather focus on the great. So, to be blunt with you, side control, how to get out. One, don't go in, okay? Two, any technique that you're gonna do is literally reverse engineering of how you got put there. So if you're in side control and you can't elbow escape, you don't really have many options. Depends on the side control variation. I've done plenty of viral videos showing of flipping over, taking the back from side control, north, south, and whatnot. It doesn't work, it's not great, it's very inconsistent, it's not worth it. I'm telling you right now the value is understanding guard retention. So for any of you who are doing stuff in bottom side control, you should literally take a step back and say, where was I before I was in side control? It was probably a guard. And if you had tempo, you should know what your grips were. And what's happening is you are literally not understanding guard retention before you get there. So I will tell you to simplify things. I will tell you to play a guard without the intention of sweeping or submitting for six to eight months and just focus on not getting past and understanding all the past sequences and intricacy, intricacy, whatever the word is, intricacies of how people will pass and you'll understand guard retention better. And I guarantee I'd be willing to bet, I'd be willing to offer free training or free privates that the level of percentage that you're getting put inside control would drastically go down. So again, as a jiu-jitsu practitioner who's not only small and a black belt, I will tell you the value of not going into something is definitely much higher and more value, it's more efficient, it's easier than going in and getting out. So trust me, it's easier to win when you're not losing. So think about that. I don't have any side control escapes. I don't have any positions really show because it depends on the variation, it depends on the body size. It's too unique, it's too hard, which is why it really doesn't work for me. I'm probably the last person to ask. So I'm sure there are DVDs and people out there that say, hey, here's side control escapes. But I promise you, you'll never see Andre Galvao or Keen Cornelius or someone else stuck in side control at a tournament consistently on bottom and saying, I always use this escape and then I win because it's not consistent and doesn't work. So keep that in mind. Is there a question? Yeah, going back to the surf pass. Yeah. Is it okay to take your right hand and uh, right hand grab and pull his right pant leg instead of the elbow? No, my left hand is grabbing the elbow. Um, my right hand is my base hand, it's my technical stand-up hand. And in fact, that hand is then retracting, and for me, it goes to the knee, because then I do my 
quick escape type sequence of passing. So let me be really blunt here, right? He's got my lapel, which I only wants. This hand is down because my technical stand up. So if I want to, I can back up. If I want to, I can go in. This hand is here. I do not take this hand and go here because maybe he closes his elbow with the lapel, whatever it may be. But now this position is not there anymore. So this hand is always keeping, once he opens it up, I keep that away from him. This hand will stay here, and when I shoot across and I go here, it comes inside of this position. And I teach this a lot, because sometimes I get here, he'll go to hip escape, he'll try to square up, I do this thing and I go here. So setting up for the next pass and everything else like that. So the hand that's grabbing the elbow grabs the elbow because I need to keep the space that is available to me. I need to stay there and I need to slow down his next sequence of a hip escape or, or response. My right hand is on the mat for a technical stand-up, so I can go in either direction whenever I want, but it's also going to be my next grip stabilization point, so I can go to a lapel, I can go to a knee, whatever it may be. I'm not grabbing my left hand that's on the elbow to the pants, because it's going to then possibly shut down if Dennis grabs the lapel and brings his elbow in, or lets go and brings his elbow in. If he lets go of the lapel, I can still keep the elbow, if not, so I keep the elbow because it keeps the, the option of surf passing away. What's the next one after the side control question? 50-50 uh, control with attack. Okay, cool. 50-50. By the way, there's a 50-50 DVD that exists. It's been out for a while. but um, Lots of different 50-50 stuff. Marcus asked this. Yes, Marcus did ask this. So there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of different attacks. There's attacks when I'm on either hip, whatever it may be. Dennis is also a very avid 50-50 guy, so we have a lot of things that we share in common. We have a lot of things that we have in other positions. So definitely depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to control, but I don't know if you're on top or on bottom, it changes things. You want to control and stay on bottom, so it's different than control and stay on top. My theory is I want to always be able to attack a leg lock. So I've got different leg locks when I go over here, and I've got when I go over here. But what's clear is I've got to pick one. So when I go here, I'm basically controlling that Dennis is going to stay on bottom and I can be on top. When I go here, I'm giving the option of Dennis getting up if he wants to get up. So again, it depends on what angle of control, which pathway of control you want to look to. Um, I, this is a DVD. My go-to, my favorite submission is this like stomp knee bar on this side. Don't want to show it to each other a thousand times. Um, there's lots of options from there. It's also like the dream killer like waist attacking with the cast slice and which stuff in there, whatever it may be. And then there's the, the leg locks that are on this side, um, which is just simply pushing off, crying, coming inside, and then going here, right? So, um, Marcus specifically loves 50-50, and actually when he was here, he was training with us before he went back to Sweden. Uh, we spent a lot of time thinking with him, and I did a lot of stuff uh, on this side with him. So when I go to this side, I'm basically starting to attack leg drives, attack leg locks, but I'm limiting my ability to keep Dennis from staying down. So this is like when I'm already down, I'm going to stay down, I'm trying to attack his back to his back, whatever it may be. So um, one of the things that we did the most with Marcus, and that, this is actually more of Dennis's thing that I took from Dennis and I kept using a lot, it's like doing the, what's the, the game grip total thing? The one with the what is it called? Hey, well, there's a bunch of different names for it, but um, what Dennis and I both do that we do is like clearing this leg here, going inside and coming here like this. So Dennis and I both do this a lot. Um, and what this does is it puts Dennis in a very awkward position of making some decisions. So if I want to, I can kick, I can come up for my leg drag, right? If I want to just stay here and Dennis brings his knee to his chest, I can start to attack this foot lock, I can attack this foot lock. If he tries to kick his leg, I can go back to my leg track again. I can kick and I can come up. Um, there's there's calf slicers, there's, there's, there's thousands of things that I can do from this position. Um, personally, I prefer to be on bottom of 50-50, which means I prefer to be over here. I prefer Dennis to be in that position. I prefer to be on this side, being down on this side. This for me is my ability to sweep and also my ability to attack my favorite E-bar position. Um, so if I'm already on bottom and I'm not interested in getting up unless I'm, so for example, let's say now what's happening with Dennis specifically is that rather than coming up and being in his 50-50, which usually will happen if I'm on this side, if I'm going to come up, I don't want to be in his guard at all. So if I'm with Dennis, I'm starting now to focus on going over here because if I do get up, I have more ability in slowing down Dennis putting in positions that he's really good at, right? If I say, okay, Dennis, let's go here, we just so happen to be in 50 50, which Dennis will probably sweep your submit me from. So it definitely depends on who you're going with and their ideology and what they're looking to do, but each one has viable options. They're kind of based on preference according to what I think about, but um, I'm a huge fan of being over here. 
I like the options that I have over here and the control that I have. 50 50 is all about butt control. So, like, whatever cheek I'm on is the side that I'm committing to. If I'm on both butt cheeks, I'm basically giving Dennis the, the, the choice if he wants at any point in time to, to pick the side because I'm not picking for him. Right? If I commit to one side, he's got to oblige. It's tempo control. So, a lot of it's just about knee line controlling. Uh, if, it's, if, it's, if it's no gi, I'm not really worried about getting heel hooked from here because we're in a neutral position, so I should have the viable option. I should be moving first because I'm controlling tempo. So, um, the DUD on 50 50 is really, really, really in depth. It's got a lot of different theories. So, I would definitely say for anyone, but not including Mark because he already has it, but definitely understand that stuff. Maybe not even follow it to a T, but use it as like a foundation and then be very playful. There's probably positions that I've never even seen or understood that's really viable now. And, People are using lapels and they're going bare and bowls from different positions I've never seen before in 50 50. But um, I would always, before going into 50 50, decide on what options I like, the other person, are they long, are they short, what, what I like to do, what, what leg locks are available. Again, if you're a brown belt or black belt, your options for toe holds, knee bars, calf slices are different than if you're a blue belt, you can only do ankle locks. So I'm not even going to go to that side because I can't do any ankle locks. I can only go to this side, right? It's going to change things. So, Definitely think about that. The control is strong, but there's lots of options. Um, and Marcus, if anything specific you're thinking about, let me know, and I will literally just record it for you and send it to you, or just tell you to watch the DVD for 10,000 um, points. Is there any questions popping up, Sasan? Next question. Guy on bottom's not doing anything besides trying not to be submitted. Nice. This was, uh, this was a couple people, but the most recent one that was more in depth in lab liberation was a friend of mine, Rich at Momentum in New Jersey. So, uh, we actually talk about a lot of my academy about different, um, what's up, the question? Yep. Is it Marcus? No, nah, Victoria Hansen. No, it's Marcus's wife. Uh, well, if, you, if you feel that you are stuck in 50-50, would you allow them to sweep to get a better attacking position? No. I mean, if I have enough time to really, really, really slow things down so much that I think that's the best possible option, I would entertain and be open minded saying yes. But because of... The time that I spent in 50-50 and only I can go either side, I would heavily commit to one. And if I'm stuck on that side, I would heavily commit to the other. And if I can get no options from there, I would definitely say I'm more than likely not controlling tempo. The person is better than me. And if I can't get out of the position, they're probably stalling and I'm going to fail there. Um, I would probably throw up some, some lower percentage submissions out of desperation, especially if I'm losing. So let's say Dennis is up. 8 to 2 and we're in 50 50 and no matter what side I get to I can't get out and change the position I would go for lower percentage more Hail Mary like submissions to attempt to acquire advantages or get Dennis to feel a threat to change the position but if Dennis is in absolute control there's nothing that I can do and in fact it's very common that if someone has so much information from 50 50 it's more like 80 20 or whatever the terminology would be but um, the key there is that and again this is what I was saying is that I feel really confident in one position with Dennis specifically and not in another. So if I'm going to change the position, I want to make sure that I'm not giving him the capability. So um, if Dennis were allowed me to sweep myself, I'm sure that it's probably a trap and he's just going to keep 50-50 or submit me from that new position. So I would try everything humanly possible with the 10 minutes that I've got in an IBJJF tournament to try everything I can before giving up points just to try and advance. Um, it would literally be me yelling at myself saying, okay, you did everything, we're on the same page, now die in order just to succeed. So to answer the question, no, unless you tried everything else first. Cool. What was the next one? Uh, oh, was the, the guy on bottom doing that. Yeah. So Chris was saying this. So um, yeah, we're good. We're right up. 218. Two Boom. Yeah. So what we're focusing on now is the fact that maybe Dennis, maybe it's submission only, maybe Dennis is in training, maybe I like Dennis, maybe he doesn't like me, maybe he's an idiot, maybe he's not. There's lots of variables that are personality-wise that we just don't know, but it's definitely a very, very common thing, a very high-value thing for someone to be in a position of not interested in doing anything other than not getting submitted. I've actually experienced this multiple times where the guy was letting me pass or he wasn't putting up a huge fight and he would give me positions, but he solely focused on just not letting me acquire really, really in-depth grips to submit him with, right? So. This is definitely a common thing. It's actually a struggle, right? If you watch, what kind of Morse was it where Gracie fought Andre, right? Keep it playful, right? So, like, it's a style. In fact, um, Jeff Glover has a style where he's very inviting, and he'll give you some positions, and he's very, very secluded, and you can't submit him with, and he lures you in, right? So, I would tell you that first, 
to consider that even while having balance or having side control or being on someone's back, that it's possible to be in such a dominant position but still not be in controlling tempo. And that's because of the position in terms of what you actually have in that position. So for example, the reason why I would pass to a very specific position with very specific grips and it's a funnel is so that the person doesn't have, doesn't have the ability to then seclude themselves in the turtle shell. So for example, let's say, let's say, let's say I was just like in half guard, right? Dennis is kind of just keeping his elbows in, he lets me go here like this, right? I would have passed this way to half guard. Sure. I would have passed like this to here because I don't have the grips that I need for this position, right? And this is sometimes rudimentary because what happens is like, yeah, this is a great position to be in, but I don't have the grips for this position. So what you want to think about is that I want to get the grips that I need later in the now time. So if you're here and you've got an underhook or whatever you're going to do, then okay, what options do I have with my underhook? I don't want to go somewhere where my underhook is obsolete or not use my underhook when I'm there. This is talking about using the grips that you need. So what's a good specific, let's say, because I think he said mount, so someone's keeping their elbows in. So you want to think about what position are we in before mount if someone's so welcoming. And we can literally reverse engineer this all the way back to the beginning to where maybe he literally just laid down, played stiff guard and said mount me. Just don't mount him. And I mean, not to be rude, but like, let's really take it. Let's just say he's just like a, one of these guys, right? Which is very, very common, right? Like, um, jiu-jitsu is supposed to be gentle, it's supposed to be nice, but it's not at the same time. So Dennis is kind of like, yeah, I don't care, you can mount, and I've seen this all the time, especially submission only. I'll just make him very uncomfortable, but that's all fight IQ in the moment. Put my knee in his belly, he doesn't move. I'll push, I'll put my knee on his neck. At some point in time, I'm gonna do something that's gonna open him up. Or what I need to do is go back to the drawing board and increase my jiu-jitsu so I have better ways of threatening him, right? Someone who's not being submitted does not feel threatened enough, which is why they're not being submitted. So the key here is that you need to be able to create a threat and everybody's threatened differently. There's a majority of people, the masses that are generally threatened in a specific way, but there's some people that are not. Some people be like, yeah, you're on my back, you didn't submit me. You're like, what? I took your back, they don't care, right? So if you don't have the grips, if you don't have the grips or the tools to the job that you want to do, you need to reverse engineer as far back as possible to a position where you can get them and then move forward. Don't move forward to dominant position without the grips that you need in those to then finish. So a good, a good example would be we're on the back, right? If I'm in this position always, I can't submit Dennis from here even though I'm on his back. If Dennis were to just put both hands on my hand and hold, I'll never submit him. So if I try to hand fight him from here, for sure, it won't work. But if I go belly down so I can jack his neck up and start moving around, his hands will come off. Create that threat, right? I would tell you that the best threat is a submission. And that will open up the opportunity for other submissions or a transfer in position. Which is why you see people that don't pass the guard, they use a submission inside the guard and then go forward. Kimura, armbar, leg lock. And although sometimes it's frowned upon, it's a great viable option of moving forward. So if, Rich, you're in the guard and you're able to pass, you're able to get to side control, you're able to get to mount, but you don't have what you need, I would tell you that you didn't get it from the position you were in previously to that one. Don't move forward. And if you do have grips and then you get there and these grips can't do the job, then go back and understand well, what can I actually do with these. And it's going to be more of a discipline thing and focal point, but it'll definitely help a lot. Are there any questions that popped up during that? Nope. Nope. What's the next one? Uh, Kimura back take. Hey, okay, so more stuff. Plenty of back takes, plenty of options from the Kimura we do here. Uh, definitely team Kimura. A lot of people are on the same page. So um, nothing fancy. The one that I do the most is like probably one of the most common ones that exists in the history of jiu-jitsu. I've done it at uh, elite black belt levels at major tournaments. I've done it as a blue belt. I've, it's never changed. The information is the same. Simple is sometimes easier, but... Um, I basically always attack the Kimura, and then the guy basically turns to defend the Kimura by bringing his elbow down, and I take his back. I do it all the time. I can force him to do it, whatever it may be, or he can do it on his own, but um, I just go right into a short choke, take the back, and there's no you can hands, and gi, no gi, whatever it may be. So um, uh, let's just say I, uh, anywhere you get, G already does this, so I'm glad he asked the question, but I don't really have any fancy back takes in here, but you you get the Kimura, somehow, some way you die for it, and you get into this position, right? So Dennis has the option of staying flat. If he does, I scissor my legs, I come up, I jam him across, 
I can still take his back. I literally put all my weight on his tricep, I shift my leg forward, and I can fall down, and I can pull across, right? We talk about being in like a hip check position. I can drive him across, I get my Kimura, all my weight goes down, step over, pull across, I take the Kimura again, right? So there's plenty of ways of doing it. Sometimes I'm here, and that is to avoid the Kimura, it starts to face me. That's probably one of the most common ways. And I see the space here, and all I do is I bring my knee into my forearm, I step my leg over, or better yet, what I do is I use my form to push on his head, go arm bar, I step my leg over, and then I pull him across, and then I take his back. So, there's nothing fancy, it's simple. In fact, the person who asked the question is someone who already does this to a lot of different people. Um, there's, there's plenty of flashy, cool Kimura back takes, but honestly, in terms of options, I find that the simple one is one that works the best, more consistent with all belt ranks, sizes, shapes, or forms. So um, anytime you have a Kimura, you have a back take, anytime you have a Kimura, you have a terrible product, you have a bunch of different things. So I would say, gee, anybody specifically, Use the Kimura, create a strong funnel. It's everywhere. The guy can either get Kimura or get his back taken. I don't know how we can do both, so just stay focused on that. But um, maybe we'll put out a Kimura DVD in the next couple of months. But for now, just stay on the simple stuff. Gandalf double pants. Nice. Okay, so someone was asking me about some options from Gandalf guard. I actually don't remember how much in depth I've done this on DVDs. Um, in fact, like, there's a very, very couple of simple options, but. Um, again, you want to talk about theory, so I thought we would do double pants. So, um, think about any guard that you have. If I've got a hybrid of grips as in a sleeve and a pant, I've got some options for submissions and for some sweeps. If you've got both sleeves, you have less options for sweeping, but you've got more options for submitting. And if I've got both pants, I've got more options for sweeping and less options for submitting. So keep that in mind. Watch Leandro Lowe, watch some guys who are really good at using the pants or pants up to sweep. It's a very strong game. They have a great, great way of not only sweeping but going right into a good position, right? So just real quick, Dennis will stand up. I'm going to Deli Kiva. I'm grabbing the same side sleeve. I'm grabbing the same side pants. What I'm doing now is kicking his leg. I'm placing my foot on his hip. What I'm doing is I'm going to pull both my grips as I push my leg away. This leg, my left leg, must be straight. In fact, I don't want to bend. I want to literally like bow and arrow, pulling his grips in because it's going to really slow things down. I'm now using that time to get on my side, throwing a deep lasso, a straight leg lasso. So now that this leg is straight, this one, my left leg can bend. If this is bent, this is straight. If this is straight, this one can bend. One must be straight. So now that my right leg is straight, I now have hip escape going forward. And I put my left knee behind his knee. We're in this Gandalf guard like position. So I like this position a lot, so we'll talk about getting double pants from here. So what I'm gonna do now is instead of like doing my, my basic tilt sweep, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this time to bring Dennis towards me and start getting him to post. When he posts on that, I let go of the sleeve and I'm grabbing the pants because now they're close to me. And now that you pull that arm out where he does it, it's easy for me to come inside. I always try to keep both of my feet at the hip or lower. If I can get both feet on the inside of the thigh, great. Both inside the groin, great hip and thigh, whatever it may be, but they're always at the hip or lower. So it really depends on your style, whatever it may be. The key here is to stay on your side. I can't stay flat because that's gonna make it very hard for me to sweep. So all you can really do is you can start to move around. You can feel your position. I can start the hip skate and come back up. I can push them away again. But all you need to do is keep the pants. And then for them, you can pick how you wanna enter, how you wanna enter, how you wanna enter, whatever you wanna do. If he grabs the sleeves, just keep control of the pants, start moving around, understand your options, but um, Gandalf guard is a great guard, it's a very strong guard. In fact, it's a very, very hard guard to pass, very challenging, but there's a lot of options from there. You go to X, you can go Omoplatos, you can go triangles, you can go double pants, you can go X guard, you can go 50-50, you can go blah, 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 blah. So Gandalf guard is great. Um, we'll go more in depth on that later, but I know that I think I have done some stuff on that on the DVDs, but if not, um, I think Andrew asked this question. So if there's anything specific you want, Andrew, let me know. I'll post some stuff just for you and I'll send it to you. But um, always think about if you want a strong sweep, get both pants. This will help you out a lot. What's the next one, Susan? Uh, stocked with armbar? Okay, yeah. stacked with armbar, right? With armbar. So someone said to me, like, hey, I'm smaller. I'm always getting triangles. I'm always getting armbar. I'm getting stacked and then I can't finish, right? So here's a detail that will help. Again, to be blunt with you, if you're smaller, you should not be accepting bottom position with your submissions. If 
If I'm on top of Dennis and I get an arm bar, I should be staying on top. If I get a triangle on top, I should be staying on top because I want to use gravity to my advantage. Don't fight against gravity, right? So if you were to somehow be going with someone that's double your size and you throw up an arm bar on them, you're probably going to get your face and soul crushed just in order to finish that arm bar. So I would invite you to consider, especially white, blue, purple belt level, consider understanding the mechanics and the, and the way the gravity works and whatnot, and that you should be on your side, you should be able to use it to give you a better dominant position. Yes, you will arm bar people and it will happen, but if you're talking about getting stacked and it sucks, here's a detail that will help. I'm gonna use close door, guy with the book from close door. So you get to your arm bar position and you're here, right? Dennis is just gonna stack, which means he's literally rolling my hips and my knees towards my face. What's happening here is my left leg is heavy on his head, and that's basically the leg that's controlling his posture. My right leg is nice and bent, which is impacting posture, but it's basically keeping more of the bite on his arm. What a lot of people do when they get stacked is they just try to retract their legs. And when you're the guy on top, you've got gravity, that's really hard. The detail that I found that worked the best is that my left leg, if you can see, Dennis is free to move his head wherever he wants. I just have my leg connected to his neck. What I do is from my knee down to my foot, rotate my foot onto the top of his head, like the crown of his head, because I know if I can move his head, his spine will move. He'll be a really good stack, Dennis. This is me trying to push him down, which is not gonna work. If I rotate my foot, I can push his head away, he'll fall down every single time. So depending on your arm bar set up, if it's my left leg, what I do is I hook the arm with my, I hook his arm with my left arm. So I have my right hand as a free hand to hook his leg. And in fact, there's a bunch of different series here. Rotate me real quick, guys. Get away. Yes, all the way, all the way, all the way. Good, right there, right? You can go here and you can just sit him down and arm bar him. You can go here and you can go all the way and you can rotate and sit him down, right? There's plenty of very, very simple, simple options. Um, to be specific, go side control real quick and just get your arm, right? You're here, maybe you got a Kimura, you're trying to arm bar him, he comes up and stacks you very, very hard. It's really hard for him to sit him down. Again, right leg, right hand is through. My left hand, I see this option all the time. All I'm doing is keeping my hips up, rotating my foot, and just keep rotating. He'll fall down every single time. Keep the leg, use my feet, snap the arm off, go back to my Kimura and step working from there, right? So, what you really want to think about, again, when being stacked, is what is Dennis able to do? He's in a position with his body, basically, where his spine is very strong. So I attack the top of his head, making his head tilt, his shoulders will tilt, his stack goes away. So triangles, arm bars, whatever it may be, you're in a state of attacking someone's posture. In this position, you're actually stuck. So it's important to, one, not get stuck. Um, but it's definitely something that's very common. But what you need to realize is that if both his hands are here, you should be able to check a leg and check a leg. But more importantly, don't just bite with your snake fangs on his neck and try to just push him down. Theoretically speaking, especially if you're smaller, you're not stronger than this person, even if you're both standing in a neutral position and you're not. Put that leg that's on the neck, rotate it to the top of the crown of his head. I guarantee you he will fall over like a three-year-old child because now the spine is out of line and he will fall over. So, that information will help. Think about that. Try it. Try to focus on not allowing yourself to get stacked. If you do, using understanding the position against them. What's next? What do you got? Deep lasso options. Okay, deep lasso options from bottom spider guard. Right. I don't think I've done any spider guard um, information really in depth um, as a DVD work. I think there's a few things actually on the all other things, but lots of options from spider. I enjoy playing spider a variation of. Um, I'm all about understanding lasso and integrity, right? So, two different types of lasso, we already talked about this, right? There's a shallow lasso. When I say shallow lasso, I mean the integrity of the lasso grip allows Dennis to be able to move his arm and circle it, right? That'd be the definition of a shallow lasso. A deep lasso would be my leg so deep that he doesn't have the ability to rotate his hand, but he will have the collar option there, right? So. I know that deep lasso is going to slow him down. There's less mobility for both of us. Shallow lasso is going to allow him to move more frantically, but we both have more mobility. So it definitely depends on what you're looking to attack and whatnot. I've got omo plot attacks from here. I've got omo plot attacks from here. I've got triangles from here. There's all different variations, whatever it may be. When I'm going with someone who is moving a lot, they are an outside guard passer, they are ferocious, they do not stop moving, they get a very deep, strong, deep lasso. 
if there's someone that's not trying to move fast, they're a little bit slower, they're lethargic, they're trying to underhook me, they're just trying to stay in the middle, and I want to be more mobile and active, I will go shallow. The option is really up to you, okay? So here's just some options that I like to do from here. We'll connect this to some other things that are also in the DVD. I like to go deep lasso, straight leg. I really feel my toes on his spine, my leg is straight. All I do now is I lift my hips up and I switch sides to the lasso side. My hand that's on the sleeve now is going to come off and going to grab cross collar. What I do is I bake this. I take my hand off the sleeve and I grab the tricep. If Dennis pulls his arm out and tries to back up, the collar drag option is there. If he stays there, I can literally, like, uh, what do we call it? The dogo or like the, like the rolling out dough here. I literally pull him in as I push. And I just use it to pick my hip up and step, again, going to my oval plotter triangle variation from here. So for those of you who like your same size, your good oval plotters and triangles, this is a great option. For those of you who don't, my hand comes up, I go inside here, I kick, I send him, and I go right into my collar drag, right? So my information regarding spider guard options from the lasso is that you should be active with the lasso and using it to attack and threaten. For me, it's, it's submission-based. So it's almost plotted because that's my best submission from this type of lasso position. So everything connects from there. My grips are ready. You can see my hands grabbing the elbow. So if I go almost plotted, I'm ready to go to that thing we talked about earlier. If I don't like that position, I go to a collar drag, there's boot chokes, blah, 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 blah. So for me, I like those grips. Those are definitely the best options for me that I like going from there. There's a thousand things. For me, again, I'm looking for a submission. I don't have any pants, so I'm not looking to sweep from there. I'm not a huge guy that's into sweeping from lasso because I feel like if I don't have the pants, he's just gonna back up and go away. So I'd rather attack, 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 and then use that position to get on top from there. So think about that, keep that in mind. What's the next one, Sasan? Uh, deep tails for shoulder down pass. Okay, so this is a huge, huge, just go down, huge topic. It doesn't matter where we're at. Over under passing, anytime both of your hands or at the hip and lower, it's like a shoulder down type pass that people are doing on the inside. Could be something, could be something like this. Could be, so, could be something like this, right? Could be something here, right? This is like a shoulder down type passing uh, style, right? What, this is what I'm getting. What you wanna remember is this, okay? If I do any of those passes, and Dennis is flat. That means that I'm looking to get side control, okay? Now, some of you, side control or mount, I apologize. What you need to remember is, is that if Dennis is flat and he takes his hands and he addresses where your hands need to go while he is flat, you are going to get stuck, okay? What that looks like is this. So, uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? So I go here, I go here like this. And Dennis puts both of his hands in a position to where he knows that I want to stabilize. So what you're seeing right now is Dennis's right hand and his left hand are framing on my hip and on my shoulder. So if I keep trying to go forward and try to bring this arm up to move, it's never going to work. So in fact, I pass, but I can't stabilize, right? This is crucial. Uh, we do a pass here where we do like just like, like Pelican pass thing. We jump here like this. The key here is that I can't let Dennis's hips be flat. Because if his hips are flat, his shoulders are so flat that what I'll do is get stuck. And then eventually I'll pass, but I can't stabilize, so square back up and it's a scramble. And probably in my blue belt line or purple belt line, I'm like, well, I got the pass. <laughs> but no, you didn't, right? So like, really think about that. The key here is that anytime both my grips are below the hips, I want to turn Dennis's hips so there's a line to his shoulders. So I have the opportunity of not only taking his back and flattening him out, but again, this option is there, right? So let's play devil's advocate here, right? I've got both pants, Dennis has both sleeves. If I simply push this leg across and put my chest down, I, theoretically speaking, do not get points for a pass, and I'm not passed if Dennis never lets go of his sleeve, okay? Now, if Dennis lets go, that's his decision, it is possible, he may do it, but if I'm him, I'm just not gonna let go. In fact, I'll probably lay down and I'll just close my eyes flat and hold the sleeve. Because the only way I'm breaking this grip, if he's not letting go, is to take my hand off and address the grip break. 
If I do that while he's flat and he hip escapes, I will not pass the guard. If he makes a mistake, a completely different story, but I'm not relying on that, correct? So the key here is that when I pass with both, pant, with both grips below the hips, that I've got to turn his hips, and I've got to utilize where he's trying to stop me against him. So in this position, when I went here like this, I would then keep pushing him, I would go leg drag, I would control the leg, and then break the grip. If I get here like this, put my knees down and go here, and then try to take my hand off, then it's just going to square back up. This variation is literally simple with anything that is below the hips. An over under pass, a double under pass, uh, a variation of pant grip pass, whatever it may be. You have to understand from a guard retention base and a passing understanding of what is actually taking place. Because what's not happening is the communication afterwards, unless you're like depending on the, the relationship you have with the person you're training with. But also look at you know say there's no way you're getting a side control if you can't stabilize the grip from my pec up. And if I hold both of your sleeves, how are you gonna do that? Uh oh, maybe you'll let go. I wouldn't rely on that, right? So really think about that. I would tell you to not let the guy be flat with his hips, to exaggerate them away, to then find that position to move up. But remember, when someone is flat, your pass options are mount, knee on belly, and side control. When they're not flat and they're at 90 degrees or more, it's taking the back. So think about that. If he's flat and you don't have any grips, how are you going to keep him flat when you let go? Think about this in your pass sequence because what you don't want to do is get attached to the fact that, well, Dennis let go, so it works. No, Dennis's jiu-jitsu sucked and it allowed me to pass his guard. Don't rely on that to happen because you'll fight with someone who doesn't suck and then you won't get that pass if you don't understand why. So keep that in mind. Is there anything popping up for me saying someone sucked or not? <laughs> no? Cool. Anything else? What's at the bottom? Um, so you finished your top 10, and now yeah. it's just the 15 that were asked. Like, oh, there's too many, right? So, yeah. um, yeah, running, five more, yeah, actually. There's said. a lot of other stuff, right? So um, this was our first one. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, Dennis has this on his YouTube. We have it on Facebook. I'll re-upload it. We'll do a bunch of things. We'll put some time slots so you can see all the information broken down. Um, if this is something you guys enjoy, obviously with what's going on, we've got plenty of time to do it every weekend, right? I'll talk to Dennis and do it in. The key here is that we'll take your questions and we'll keep moving forward with it. But we did a decent amount of stuff today. I don't want to overload anybody's brains, including mine or Dennis's or Sasan, to take away from the family time today. So um, let's just say today, thank you guys for everything that you're doing. Again, we all hope that you and your family are safe, you're healthy. We really hope that we take a, whatever, whatever the term is, flattening the curve of what's going on so we get back to training. But for now, um, my opinion would be to stay home, to stay away from people, and let's get this thing out of the way so we can get back to jiu-jitsu, whatever it may be. So in the meantime, if it helps to film some stuff, to have webinars, whatever it may be, I'm always here. If anybody needs anything, if you want to see something specifically, message me. I will literally film it and I will send it to you. It's not a problem, okay? As soon as we are done here, as soon as this goes off live, I will re-edit everything. The donation stuff will be there. The information will be there. But stay posted. If you can't donate, share. It's fine. If you can donate, awesome. It's Venmo or PayPal. If you guys enjoyed what we did today, be, be very open with your communication. Let me know. Say something. Say, hey, can we do this again? Like, hey, this really works. If you have more questions, let me know. We'll build off it on the next one. But Dennis and I were talking. We'd like to do this more consistently, even when the coronavirus thing is gone. So this way you always have this option of coming back to this information. So thank you for today. We hope you guys had a great time. Be patient. The information will be edited and uploaded ASAP for you guys. But we hope you guys had a good day. If you have any questions, let us know. And other than that, we will see you later. All right, my brothers. Cool. See you guys later.